please come back to the dais. Okay. I would like to call to order the council meeting of March 11th. Mr. Clerk, if you would read the roll, please. Councilmember Dunbar. Councilmember Garza. Here. Councilmember Hussein. Here. Councilmember Jackson. Here. Councilmember Spadafore. Councilmember Spitzley. Here. Councilmember Washington. Here. Councilmember Wood. Here. There are eight members present at quorum. Um, we will be rising for meditation and the Pledge of Allegiance. Before we do that, I'd like to remember uh, Rita Klein, who passed away on March 8th. Uh, she was, is retired, was retired from the Lansing um, School District. Um, she worked at Lansing Sexton and Lansing Eastern School and taught uh, writing and journalism. She also served as an Ingham County Commissioner from 1983 to 1986. Um, she was a member of the Churchill Downs um, Neighborhood Organization and an active member of the League of Women Voters. Also, if we could keep Rita's family as well as Kathy Miles and her family in our prayers. Kathy Miles lost her husband on Sunday. Um, he had gone in for surgery and there were some consequences complications and uh, he passed away on Sunday. So if we could keep the, um, her in our prayers as well. Thank you. Thank you. I pledge You have for your approval the printed council proceedings of uh, February 25th. Uh, Vice President Spadafore. Madam President, I move the approval of the printed council proceedings for February 25th, 2019. I have a motion. Are there any questions or concerns? Seeing none, <laughs> excuse me, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Passes unanimously. Okay, I don't believe there's any later items. We are to the order of comments by council members and the city clerk. Are there comments by council members? Council member Washington. Um, thank you, Madam President. First, I want to thank everybody that came to my constituent meeting um, about a week and a half ago. It was a great turnout, a lot of really good discussion. Thank you to council members Hussein and Garza who allowed me to sit in on their constituent meetings um, so that I could hear what their constituents had to say basically about the Red Cedar Project. Hands down, Councilman Garza serves oh, the best God. food yeah. of any of us. I will be going periodically just for the food. That's for <laughs> constituents only. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have just a couple announcements here. The East Side Neighborhood Organization is holding their annual um, Spring Super. This will be held Saturday, March 23rd, 2019, 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. It will be at the Pattengill Biotechnical Magnet School. That's the old Fairview School, and it's at 815 North uh, Fairview. This is the major fundraiser for the Eastside Neighborhood Organization, and uh, I believe it's a quarter of the profits do um, go to a nonprofit in the city. Um, all children, ticket prices are adults $5, children under 14, $3. Families of four or more, it's just a flat rate of $18. So please be supportive of the East Side. The ENO is always very supportive of all sides of the city when they have pressing issues. Again, East Side Neighborhood Organization Spring Super. The other thing I have is this is a free event. I, full disclosure, I sit on the Lansing for Cesar A. Chavez Committee, and we are holding our ninth annual dinner and dance scholarship event. This is how we raise money for the scholarships um, that we have for the Cesar A. Chavez uh, Remembrance. 
This will be held Saturday, March 30th, Local 652 UAW Hall. This is at 426 Clare Street. Dinner uh, begins at 6 p.m. Uh, and it goes until 7.30 p.m., and then there's a dance afterward. I think um, Tejano Sound Band is playing, but um, we have a, a keynote speaker. The scholarships will be given out. We're going to have the winner actually read their, their essay this year. So we're very excited. So please come support us. Come support the students if you can. If you have any questions, call City Council office, and we'll be glad to give you the information again. Thank you. Other council member, council member um, Jackson, then council member Spitzley. Thank you, Madam President. Just want to remind everybody of our fourth ward constituent contact meeting every fourth Saturday of the month at Gregory's on MLK 2510 North MLK. We talk about anything city of Lansing related. Um, and I also want to invite anybody to the intergovernmental relations committee meeting. It's 8.30 in the morning this Wednesday the 13th. We're continuing our discussion on a climate action plan and we're excited about it and hope that we receive all the input and anybody that wants to help is welcome to join us. Thank you. Council Member Spitzley. Thank Council you, Madam President. Council Member Spadafore afterwards. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I just wanted to give a shout out to um, Pastor Victor Trevino at the Bread House. This weekend they had a fundraiser and they were selling um, enchilada dinners they were awesome and so you know they have those they have those fundraisers um every once in a while and i just wanted to i mean it's just a great way to you know go and you support the church but um it was really good um i will uh second that uh council member garza does have the best food and it's not just for constituents thank you <laughs> council member spadafore thank you madam president i also wanted to thank folks for coming out to my constituent contact meeting on thursday evening we were at the Nut House and there was chicken wings and nachos, but uh, it's just throwing it out there. Um, the next one will be on May 9th from 6 to 8. We're looking at another loca a different location to accommodate a different part of the city. And also, while I have the floor, I wanted to commend Mayor Shore on his impeccable style this evening. Um, over the weekend, we placed a bet on the winner of the we call it a rivalry, but really it doesn't seem to be that much anymore. Um, basketball game, and the winner had to pick a, a tie for the, the loser. Um, and, and in this case, we're both winners, because uh, Mayor Shore gets to wear an MSU bow tie to city council this evening. So. Thank you, okay. Mayor Shore, for being a good sport. And go green. <laughs> <laughs> Any other uh, council comments? Council member who's- Just very quickly, I also want to thank uh, the folks that came out on Saturday to the Alfreda Schmidt Southside Community Center for our constituent contact meeting. Uh, and in particular, I'd like to thank um, Darrell Slaughter, who is the third district county commissioner uh, for, the, for Ingham County, uh, as well as Sandra Kowak Thompson. She has actually been a police board commissioner for the past 19 years. She's our ward representative over in third ward, uh, but she's also the chairperson of that commission. And then we also had uh, Eric Helzer, uh, as well as um, Chris Turkowski from the Red Cedar Development Team uh, on hand. And, and all presentations were fantastic. The information was great. And the, uh, as always, the conversation was rich. So we really appreciate folks that uh, came out this past Saturday. For folks that want to attend in the future, we do meet second Saturday of every month at 5825 Wise Road. That's uh, the Elfrida Smith Southside Community Center. We meet from 10 to 12 noon. And I don't think my food's too bad. It's not, it's not Jersey Giants and, and wings and things of that nature. But uh, come on out and, and see what we have. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Any other comments? I would like to, um, <coughs> excuse me, also invite people to the uh, Cesar Chavez Memorial um, program that we will be having here in the chamber at noon on Friday uh, the 29th. And um, at that time, we will have a guest speaker. Uh, we're having the children from Luton School that will be here. Um, and it's uh, about an hour event. It's a free event. Um, there is uh, a luncheon that's served afterwards, and so we hope that you'll be able um, to come out and um, be part of that. We'll also have that on City TV if you're not able to come out to be able to see that again on City TV. Um, with that, Mr. Clerk. Uh, thank you, President Wood. A couple of announcements. Uh, as I think we've indicated, there is a uh, city uh, special election 
uh, that impacts most of the residents of the city. Uh, it's a, a millage election for the uh, Lansing School District. Uh, for those who are on our permanent absent voter list, we have mailed out the applications, and I know a lot of people got them because we got several hundred back in the mail today. Um, uh, we will be mailing out uh, the actual ballots at the end of this month, so uh, in the next couple weeks, those who have gotten the application, uh, get those back to us so that we can uh, be ready to send your ballot out as soon as we get it. Um, and uh, again, uh, in November, there were some constitutional changes uh, that impact voting. Uh, folks can vote absentee without having any reason. Uh, so anyone is able to participate uh, in the election that way. Uh, there's also been a change to voter registration. Uh, <coughs> under the new constitutional amendments, folks can register up to 15 days before uh, the election uh, in any of the normal ways. And then uh, people who aren't registered can actually uh, register up to and including the day of the election. Uh, so we'll be getting more information out about that, uh, but just wanna encourage folks to participate in, the, in that election. Uh, and then additionally, I'd like to note uh, that uh, we have half of the city council is up for uh, election this year. Uh, so we have two at large seats and the first and third ward. Uh, the filing deadline for those offices is about six weeks away. Uh, the deadline is four o'clock on Tuesday, April 23rd. If folks are interested in running for those positions, uh, you can contact my office on, on how to get on the ballot. Uh, and with that, we are to community event announcements. Is there anyone with a community event? Anyone with a community event? I see, see no none. one. Okay. Then uh, we are to registration for public comment on legislative matters and show cause hearings. We do have some show cause hearings. So uh, those are the uh, blue and green sign-in sheets in the back. The show cause hearings uh, is the green sheet. And we have three of those. And then legislative matters, if you wa want to talk about any of the items on the consent agenda, resolutions for action, ordinances for introduction or ordinances for passage that's the blue sheet and we'll be picking that up in just a couple seconds so jump up real quick if you want to sign up and have it uh, and with that we are to the mayor's comments mayor shore thank you <coughs> to get that right um, first I, I, I will go through some of the citizen engagement opportunities coming up in the next two weeks. Um, between March 11th and March 24th, we have our Neighborhoods in Bloom applications. So we have um, 50 additional flower kits for Neighborhoods in Bloom flower planting. Um, these kits are free to neighborhoods so they can beautify their part of Lansing. The kits are distributed on Neighborhoods in Bloom Day, which is May 18th. So if you have any further information or if you need any further information, you can call our Neighborhoods and Citizen Engagement or visit the City of Lansing Neighborhoods website to learn more. Uh, nominations for the 2019 Love Lansing celebration are now open. So uh, if you know of a volunteer who's a positive influence in your Lansing neighborhood, you can uh, nominate them. The nomination forms are online, again, at our city website or at City Hall. The nominations are open until April 1st at 5 p.m. And then the Love Lansing celebration will be Tuesday, May 14th at the South Washington Office Complex. Uh, the city's Mar March Mobile Food Pantry will be Saturday, March 16th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. at Tabernacle of David, which is 2645 West Holmes Road. Um, and then finally, uh, just a reminder to everybody that our Lansing, LansingMI.gov slash parks um, or Foster Community Center, you can find our summer activities guide and register for all kinds of wonderful programs through our parks. Um, and if you're looking for a summer job, if you're 18 or older and looking for a summer job, um, you can go to lansingmi.gov slash jobs and um, you're, you're always welcome at the city of Lansing. Um, I wanna add that I know, I wanna congratulate uh, Pastor Aaron Milton, who was elevated yes. to bishop by the Church of God in Christ. Um, it was, uh, I was unable to be there and I apologize, but I, I recorded a video of, of, of congratulations, but I hear that uh, it was a tremendous, Tremendous celebration, it's a great honor, and I want to make sure that to uh, congratulate uh, Bishop Milton uh, on his elevation. And, uh, and finally, I will um, thank two of my colleagues, uh, 
Councilman Peter Spadafore for being uh, so gracious in victory. Um, <laughs> we had a small bet, and um, I would say my team was not victorious on this day, so congratulations once again to the MSU Spartan basketball team for a, a good victory, for winning the, the Big Ten, uh, jointly with Purdue, but let's forget that Purdue lost to both Michigan and Michigan State. So um, <laughs> the whole state was happy when Minnesota beat Purdue. It was unifying. Um, but uh, so thank you to Councilman Spadafore. Thank you to all out in the audience who took their time to vote on his social media and on traditional media on whether it should be a tie or a bow tie. I am wearing the bow tie, <laughs> Councilman Spadafore's bow tie. Um, and I will admit that uh, our wonderful city clerk uh, assisted me in in putting on said bow tie, <laughs> as it's not something I regularly do. And he was uh, um, very, very, uh, he was an excellent teacher, so I appreciate that. Uh, so uh, it's, always, it's always nice to have some fun uh, with your colleagues. Uh, I know uh, Congresswoman Slotkin also got to eat some awesome food at the expense of Congresswoman Dingle. Um, so I appreciate the, the good ribbing and the, the good humor and, uh, and congratulations to the Spartans. They're a, they're a force to be reckoned with going into the tournament and the NCAAs. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we are to show cause hearings. We have three show cause hearings this evening. One consideration of orders for make, safe, or demolish at 3815 Marion, uh, 4704 Hughes, and 434 South Francis. And Okay. Uh, yes. Council Member Spitzley. Thank you, Madam President. Um, the first one on is for. Um, Go ahead. I'm sorry. The first one on is for 3815 Marion. Um, this this, was, this uh, home um, has been inspected by code enforcement a number of times. Um, <laughs> The SEV of, of the house has been estimated at $31,200. The estimated cost of repairs um, uh, have estimated to be $88,000, which include um, plumbing and extensive electrical. Um, we just got um, a note from um, our, our code enforcement today um, saying that there has been an additional inspection um, on site on March 8th. Um, and the inspection was disapproved due to several outstanding issues. Um, some stuff has been done, um, but uh, there also has been some wiring and equipment um, and some other repairs that have not been done. Um, and that's just the electrical permit. No other permits have been applied for and other major work such as the plumbing hasn't been started. Um, I'd like to add that this has been um, almost a year to make, you know, that we've worked with uh, the owners of the property to um, make safe. Um, and they were granted a 30 day extension before the first hearing. Um, and then it went to uh, the uh, administrative hearings officer and they gave them another 60 day extension um, before a decision was made that they were not in compliance. And so, um, at this point, they are still asking the council to rule 60 days for make safe and demolish. That's for 3815 Marion. Do you want me to continue? Yes, okay. that's great. The next one is for 4704 Hughes Road. Um, this property is vacant, as a matter of fact. Um, it was tagged March 27, 2018. Um, with uh, severe plumbing and electrical issues and a basement full of water. Um, the floor of the home is collapsing because of the water damage. Um, the SEV on the property is determined to be $36,100. Um, the cost of the repairs um, are estimated to be $80,000. Um, and so the demolition board uh, ruled for 60 days make safe or demolish. And it was noted that um, at that um, hearing, um, the, the owner of the property did not attend. So they are recommending we um, approve, make safe, and demolish for that facility as well. The last one um, is for 434 Francis. This is just a garage, um, uh, but the, um, 
the garage's SEV is estimated to be um, uh, $10,350. It is estimated that it will cost um, $22,176 to make safe. Um, the, the door isn't safe. It's, it's kind of a, um, it's a brick or a stone facility and there are cracks, looks like there's cracks in the foundation. And so it, it is not safe. And so based on that, um, they've been asked, they've asked the council to um, approve the make safe or demolish. Thank you. Thank you. And our first speaker is Aileen Ruth uh, Wilkins, followed by David Wilkins. You have three Hello. Minutes. Three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Aileen Ruth Wilkins. I go by Ruth. Uh, Mayor Shore, may I say you are an extremely difficult person to get hold of. The tie is becoming on you. I have tried at least 87 times to get through to your office to get hold of you and have never received a call back. I just want you to know that. Okay, and then for Councilman Garza, do you own a restaurant or what's the deal? I, I, Why are you such a good one for the eating? Ma'am, you have, you have three I minutes. I know I have three minutes. Um, <clears throat> I am almost 70 years old. I have lived in my home since I was three days old. My father built my home. My home has four arches in it. It has a fully functional fireplace, and it has some problems. We have worked on the problems. I have a problem in that I fell down the stairs, not because there was any clutter there, uh, on July the 8th, and I have been in a convalescent home ever since and been unable to do very much at all. Uh, my arm is permanently ruined, cannot use it. <coughs> my husband has been doing the best he can. He has been working at it. We have had several people in there. We have turned in bids for everything except for plumbing. At an original thing, we had four bids for plumbing. The lowest was $9,822. The highest was 12000 We did not have $12,000 in our back pocket. I'm not sure if you guys would, but we did not. We have complied with everything else. We have done the electrical. It has been done. We have worked on the, the uh, stairway. We have done the, uh, oh, in the kitchen, the cupboard, uh, the cupboard uh, presentation. My husband is completely redoing the bathroom with a plumber doing something. We finally found last week a plumber who will do the job for $3,822. I have two churches that will be making a collection in the next two weeks, hoping to come up with $3,822 to have this plumber come in. I feel very abated by the city of Lansing. I've lived here all my life, and I have been to all of the parks. I have been to all, a tremendous amount of meetings and several churches in the area. My husband and I helped to start two churches in the area that are going in, in very good shape. My home needs help. I am a senior citizen. Thank you. Help me instead of Thank condemning you. me. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, and next is David Wilkins. Hello, my name is William David Wilkins. I was at the house when it was inspected by the electrician. He found a fixture that was not even included in the original bid to be replaced and a electrical outlet that was not grounded, which was he wants to put a ground fault in, and that was the only thing he mentioned to me. That was wrong. Everything else was, has been done. And he said when he comes back with those corrections, he will give a total passage on it. Those are very minor details. Plumbing, we have, yes, uh, it's been a while. We were, as she says, we've been trying to get bids that were down within reasonable price. The plumbers were contacted last week 
they will do the work, provided we get them prob uh, more than what we got. We have the money right now for the permit. We asked them to get the permit so you would have it today, but they would not do that until they get a little more money beyond the permit. Uh, bathroom, when I got into the bathroom, I found that uh, sometime in the past, part of it, the walls had been removed so that the, plumb, so that the tub could go in it. We removed the tub. We're gonna replace the tub. It has now been totally drywalled, the sections of that area, with green board. Uh, the flooring was slightly off kilter. We have supports underneath it to hold the thing up. To, uh, because it was, when it was done by her father, he built some, he cut some jo uh, floor joists that should not have been cut. Um, so we're getting that all corrected. The kitchen floor is ready for linoleum and we will be putting linoleum and I've got carpet for the bathroom already. Uh, and underneath the tub we will be putting linoleum, which I will have. The rest of the house is basically very livable and everything is all right with it. Those are the two, that's the biggest areas. And I see that it would seem like it would not take more than I say 30 days once the plumbing is done to actually get that occupied with the take off from it. It could take 60, but but uh, we have churches that are trying to help us out, whereas 18,000 for and that. Uh, we felt that the 88,000 that you got was very high and also so did the in, in inspector at the time. Thank you, Thank um, you. sir. The process for this is it will be going to public safety on the 17th, which is this Thursday. Um, in order when you come, uh, if you decide to come on Thursday at 3.30, uh, the things that you will need to present to uh, the public safety committee is a timeline on how long it will take you to get the work done, a show that you that the permits have been pulled that need to be pulled um, in order to do the work and to be able to demonstrate that you have the means to be able to do the work. And so those are the three criteria that you will need for the committee to review at that time. And it will be here on the 10th floor back here in our conference room um, behind the dais here. And that's at 3.30 on Thursday. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, on the referral of the public of the show cause hearings number one through V eight fifteen, Marion, and they will go to uh, back to public safety. Uh, Forty seven oh four Hughes. Back to public safety. And four thirty four South Francis. And that will go back to public safety. Okay, we're to public comment on legislative matters. Um, and as I indicated, legislative matters includes the items on the consent agenda, resolutions for action, ordinances for introduction, and ordinances for passage. Uh, our first speaker is Raleigh Van Fossen, and he's followed by Robert Ovalle. President Wood, council members, Mayor Shore, thank you. My name is Raleigh Van Fossen, and I'm the executive director at Capital Area Housing Partnership. I'm joined here tonight in the audience by our board chairman, Tom Lapka, and our project consultant, Mickey Drosty. For the past 25 years as a nonprofit community housing developer here in the mid-Michigan area, Capital Area Housing Partnership has assisted over 200 families um, and homes obtain and reach home ownership. We've assisted over 5,000 individuals with home ownership financial related counseling. And recent projects completed include Deer Path Apartments in East Lansing, the Bailey Center in downtown East Lansing. We currently have eight single family homes under construction in the city of Lansing this year. I'm here tonight to discuss two properties that we've acquired in December of 2018, the Walnut Street Apartments and the Ferris Manor Apartments. 
As a combined project, our intention is to submit a tax credit application in April 1, and funding for those properties would provide the necessary improvements to them, both interior and exterior. It would bring project-based vouchers to those projects, assuring that the residents there would be able to maintain safe, quality, and affordable housing, and it would create a supportive um, services reserve, assuring that the residents who live there are receiving the services necessary with our partners, including Advent House Ministries, the Community for Mental Health, and Holy Cross. For this project to move forward, it requires action from this council. There currently exist two pilots already in place at those properties, and our first request with this ordinance is to put the pilots, one, in our name, now that we've gained ownership of them, and secondly, to ask for an extension of two years on the Walnut Street Apartments pilot and a four-year extension on the Ferris Manor Street Apartments pilot. That would then bring both of those pilots um, extension to end in year 2036, both respectively. All of this allows for those procedures to align with our tax credit compliance. For the past 15 years, both of those properties have offered a place for residents in this city to come to call home, in many cases, the most in need in our community. And we're hopeful with your support here uh, that we'll be able to assure that that legacy carries on. Um, we'll remain through the agenda in case you have any questions um, when this comes up on common. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Robert Ovalle and then Loretta Stanaway. Uh, I wanted to talk about the, uh, the little carts. The scooters. Yeah, the scooters. Uh, thank you, Ms. Woods. Uh, I don't see a problem with those, uh, you know, except for maybe like we're in the downtown area. Uh, I know a lot of people that ride them. Uh, they say they're fun. I never rode one, uh, but uh, I also want to talk about uh, there was uh, something that happened with the uh, ornaments out here in front by Michigan Avenue on Washington. They, uh, somebody broke, broke, ran into one and broke them, and so they were destroyed. And I didn't even see them up there tonight. I came in, I was looking for them, and I was like, oh, and I took out the ornaments. Uh, but uh, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and uh, I just want people to, Cesar Chavez's birthday is on uh, March 31st. And uh, my son passed away two years ago, March 29th. Uh, so if you can remember in your prayers and uh, live a lot. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Next is Loretta Stanaway and then Bob Hart. Hi there. Red Cedar, um, I'm gathering they have submitted a redone Brownfield proposal, and I haven't had a chance to go through it line by line, but it looks like there might be some improvements. Um, however, it is still in a floodplain, and I still am not clear on where they would divert floodwaters to in the event of a flood. And I see that three of the surface parking lots are in 10-year floodplain zones. Um, so I'm not sure how that would work if there were flooding. And even under the, uh, the integrated parking structure, the first level is, is parking. So I'm curious to know if there were a flood and, and vehicles in that first level and on the surface lots were flooded, who would be responsible for replacing and repairing those cars? Who would be responsible for the loss of work that would accrue during the times that those buildings were inaccessible? Um, it just, there's a lot of unanswered questions there. And don't forget, too, that that is in a recently discovered earthquake fault line. And anytime you're talking about earthquake fault lines, I think stilts, which is essentially what this would be built on, could be problematic. Um, there is still uh, a recommendation on my part that you consider dropping the brownfield from 30 years to 15 years. I think that that would be a lot more palatable to the taxpaying public and to all the entities that would be going without 
the tax revenues for those 30 years as it stands now. Um, we don't generate from this project anywhere near enough new income tax revenue to compensate for the loss of property tax revenue over 30 years, especially once you consider the $123 million it amounts to with interest included. Don't forget also that the city will be incurring additional costs for un uncompensated additional cost for police and fire, code compliance, roads, sewers, utilities, etc. As it sits now, this costs us nothing. We can afford to wait for either a better deal or a different deal. The cost of the loss of all of the heritage trees that were cut down without authority a couple of years back impacted the property values, which then translated into lower sale price for the property, equating to a self-enrichment for the developer who acted without authority in cutting down those trees. We currently have 61 acres of public parkland there, and they're leaving us with a 20-acre public park. That's a two-thirds loss of green space at a price that they only paid $33,000 an acre for. I think that if they're going to get this brownfield, they need to, at the very least, agree to never apply for any Oprahs on these properties. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Bob Hart. Yeah, I came to speak on the on the uh, uh, property that was made safe for demolish. Yes, you may. And I live next door to 4704 Hughes Road, and there's been two different hearings that I've been to, this one and, and one with the code that the property owners haven't shown up. And twice they have come out. The last time after the code meeting, they come out and put a uh, particle board over two windows and took some more trash out of the house, and it's an eyesore and it's, it's dangerous. And it needs to be torn down. And if they can't seem to show up to a hearing, I would think that it would behoove you guys to put a dozer in there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was our final speaker. So we are to the consent agenda. Vice President Spadafore. Madam President, I would like to remove all the items under one, two, why not make it three from the consent agenda? All right, so. So that takes us to resolutions for action and I believe we're first going to briefly go to the Committee on General Services. Uh, Council Member Washington. Thank you, Madam President. What we have before us is a resolution uh, for a confirmation of appointment for Thomas Buholz, TJ, Bullholz as a business owner member of the Downtown Lansing, Inc. Would you like to come forward? I see you out there. You can bring, is this your wife? She can come too for the picture, photo <laughs> op. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm really glad you're here. Um, TJ came before us. Um, he's a business owner in the downtown area. Um, he outlined his experience in the public relation fields and uh, his business. He um, intends to, what he is hoping for is to encourage diversity in businesses downtown, communicate the board's goals to all and future tenants to build a communications network with them. Right now his um, business is, I believe you said a block away from city council, your lease is coming up, but you have full intention of staying downtown Lansing. And for that, we're very grateful. So with that, um, does anybody have any questions or comments? We have a motion on the floor. Any questions or comments? Seeing none. I haven't moved the resolution yet. Wasn't that a move? No, uh -huh. it really was not. Okay. But I can do that now. Uh, all right. <laughs> With and that, I'll ask for questions and comments. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bullholz has been fully vetted by the mayor's office, and he is fully qualified. So with that, I would uh, move the resolution. All right, we have a motion on the resolution. All those in favor say aye. I oppose, same sign. And so we're going to have you turn just, yep, okay. Okay. 
I do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Michigan. And I will faithfully discharge the duties as a member of the Downtown Lansing Inc. Board according to the best of my ability. Thank you. Okay, and as we're um, signing those documents, I'm gonna go back to Councilmember Hussein, and I believe you are going to deal with um, C and, or B and C first. Yes, we're gonna do B, B, C, we'll go back to A and then we'll do D. Okay. Uh, so the first thing we have before us, this is the Lansing Economic Development Corporation Real Town Project. Pablo's Mexican, Mexican Restaurant, 1102 South Washington Avenue in West Elm Street. Uh, what this is, Mr. Maldonado of uh, Pablo's Mexican Restaurant uh, is looking to open up a second uh, Pablo's Mexican Restaurant in Rio Town at 1102 South Washington. He has applied, the, the project, the total cost is $460,000. He's applied for a business assistance financing loan from the LEDC uh, in an amount of $143,000. Um, as part of, and we had a public hearing on this on February 25th, Mr. Maldonado, we appreciate the fact that you have been with us at every stage of the process. Um, in any event, the, the restaurant would accommodate 140 seats. Um, there is a um, plan for patio um, seating as well that it will actually face South Washington. Uh, at the public hearing, I did want to address one issue that was uh, referenced. Um, and, and that was the issue of parking. So we took that up in development and planning at our last meeting. Uh, behind the restaurant, so immediately west of the restaurant, uh, there is a 20 space parking lot. Mr. Maldonado, Mr. Maldonado also owns additional parcels uh, west of that lot all the way up to the river. Um, and so if parking does become an issue, there is the option in the future to build additional parking. There's also on-street parking uh, on South Washington. It's a very walkable, bikeable uh, district and, and the thought um, is that individuals from the neighborhoods and from the businesses and from the river trail and things of that nature uh, will actually travel their way on foot, on bike, on uh, to this restaurant. So we don't, we don't predict that there will be a number of issues in terms of um, parking uh, and, and parking accommodations. In any event, as part of, um, it's driven by state statute, what we have before us tonight is final approval of the project plan that's been submitted by the LEDC. Uh, so the LED, LEDC Board of Directors actually has to approve this plan. Um, City Council has to approve this plan for this, uh, for this loan to actually be approved. So with all of that being said, and this is our final consideration, I would move uh, the resolution to approve the project plan. We have a motion before us. Are there any questions or concerns? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Passes unanimously. Uh, Council Member Hussein. All right, so the next item, this is Brownfield Plan Number 62, Amendment Number 1. The applicant is the George F. Ide Family, LLC. This is for the Oliver uh, Towers Redevelopment Project, 310 North Seymour Avenue. Uh, we have discussed this at length as well. We did have a public hearing on uh, March 25th. Uh, this deals with, there was a Brownfield Plan that was put in place subsequent to Lansing, Heart, um, Lansing Housing Commission and the City of Lansing partnering back in 2015 to actually sell this property uh, to the Ide uh, family. Um, the project, as explained to us, uh, in the, the project, well, let's talk about the project, 88 one-bedroom uh, apartments uh, and eight two-bedroom apartments are planned for, uh, as well as 4,400 square feet of commercial and office retail space on the, on the first floor. In any event, the project was difficult to put together. Uh, the interior tear out and demo took longer than expected. Uh, and so there has been uh, a few amendments proposed in terms of the actual brownfield plan. And so I'll go over those very quickly. The original plan called for $8 million in private investment. Uh, the eligible activities uh, approved for a reimbursement amounted to, I believe it was $2.4 million. Uh, the eligible activities were supposed to be completed by December of 2018. And then the capture period that were, was part of the plan uh, was planned for 19 years. The new Brownfield plan in terms of the amendments calls for a $14.7 million uh, investment, the eligible activities to be uh, completed uh, by December of 2019, so we've extended it a year. Um, the capture period is actually down to 12 years and the reimbursement uh, amount is down from 2.4 million uh, to just south of 1.4 million. Um, we again did have a public hearing on this. We did not hear um, that I can recall 
uh, any negative commentary uh, or uh, concerns with regards to these amendments. So with that being said, I would move the amended Brownfield plan. We have the Brownfield before us and also in your packet there was a question asking about local vendors and that material is in the red binder uh, that was provided by um, the company. Did you want to speak to that? Yeah, just very quickly. So what we did in development and planning is we did discuss um, uh, contract. What they did was they provide, so the list that you're actually looking at, uh, that is a list of um, bids solicited uh, and also bids received and bids awarded. Uh, and that is what we asked. They are using Wheeland as their general contractor, and you can see that a number of the contractors are from the city of Lansing or the region uh, in terms of you know, who has been used. Uh, they were not able to, uh, which we did have on the Metro Place project, they were not able to get the number of Lansing employees. Um, but again, you see what firms have been hired. Thank you. All right, thank you. Are there any other questions or concerns? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye, opposed, same sign. Passes unanimously. So, Mr. Hussain, that takes us back to. Okay, so this is uh, for the setting of a public hearing consideration of Brownfield Plan Number 72, the Red Cedar Development at 203 South Clippert. Uh, I do see Mr. Helzer uh, in the audience as well as uh, Mr. Strakowski. Uh, if you if you all would like to join us, uh, that would be be very much appreciated. As they're coming down, I'll give just a little bit of history uh, in in a little bit of discussion on why we're here. Uh, back in 2007, uh, the Red Cedar Golf Course was closed by the Bernero administration. In 2011 and 2012, we went to the electorate um, once for 48 acres and, and again for 12 acres, uh, and we were asking for permission to dispose or sell of that land. Uh, subsequent to that, there was an RFP put out, uh, in, which is a request for proposals in 2012. And in 2014, it's quite the team. In 2014, um, City Council did approve a pre-development agreement. Last year, July of 2018, uh, we actually approved a development agreement uh, and purchase agreement. And since then, we've been awaiting uh, the Brownfield plan uh, that we were promised. Uh, there's a couple different things uh, that are, are happening right now with regards to this project. Uh, one is there is actually an amended development agreement uh, that will be going through the Committee of the Whole process as well as City Council. Uh, and then the Brownfield plan is actually going through Development and Planning and City Council. Uh, so I have asked uh, the team to be here, and I see that we have LEAP officials with us as well. We appreciate you guys being here um, to discuss this Brownfield plan, uh, to take questions, um, and, and then we can deliberate after that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Who would like to um, start? All right, thank you. There. <laughs> Green light. There we go. Okay. <laughs> I want to thank everybody uh, for having us here today. Um, we've had uh, quite quite the journey, as everybody knows, and I'm going to let Christopher speak here in a second as he gets set up. But uh, we want to thank um, the, uh, the everybody for their time. We've had an opportunity to speak at a number of ward meetings over the uh, last couple of years. Um, we've learned a lot, and hopefully everybody's learned from uh, us, and, and we've uh, taken back all of those questions. Uh, and we have uh, modified uh, a number of things within the project to address those, and that goes all the way back to uh, when we did the Charettes and when was that? 2014. In 2014. Um, and to as recently as uh, this past weekend, um, and in fact, uh, we've modified our presentation accordingly to address a number of questions that uh, uh, the constituents um, had in, in the two wards that we met in uh, over the weekend. Um, Christopher, do you want to add anything? Um, other than the fact that uh, it's been a pleasure meeting with all the community groups, uh, we've met with the mayor staff. Obviously, we've worked tirelessly with LEAP. Um, you know, the development team itself has reached out to everyone uh, as much as we possibly could to try to answer questions, take ideas, take recommendations, and try to move the project forward. Okay. And we do have a presentation. Um, I didn't know if uh, LEAP wanted to make a couple of comments. Okay. Sounds good, so we'll just get right, right. into it. Okay. Yep. Yep. We're all set. Okay. So this is um, sort of the presentation piece that we've put out. Uh, we presented this at both council meetings on Saturday. Um, continue moving forward. We're trying to recognize that this is a connecting piece along the corridor, that it's a catalyzing opportunity, and it's as also transformational. I want to introduce myself. My name is Christopher Strakowski. I'm the project manager here in Lansing for Continental Ferguson. And 
Uh, Eric Elzer, uh, Advanced Redevelopment Solutions, and I'm um, doing the incentives uh, evaluation and, and packaging of the Brownfield plan. And I'm Jason Hockstock with Continental Real Estate, uh, Vice President or Vice President of uh, Planning and Development for Continental. Next slide, please. Next. So one of the emphasis that we have when we talk and interact with both um, council and community groups and just people in general talking about the project as a whole, um, we want to make sure that we acknowledge and understand that we've created partnerships and more importantly relationships. And those are listed on there. We have uh, Continental Ferguson Development, which makes up our team. We have LEAP. Uh, LSG Engineers, I have Alan Boyer in the audience today. Uh, Advanced Redevelopment Solutions, that's Eric's company. The Edge Group is out of Columbus and they're our design. City of Lansing, Mayor's Office, the uh, MDNR, Williamstown Township, and Jason will make sure and point that out later in the presentation. Uh, the MEDC, uh, the Ingham County Drain Office, and the MDEQ. Next slide, please. And continuing on that same path when we talk about a P3 partnership, public-private partnerships are very important moving forward where we reach out and have conversations, have dialogue, look at opportunities for solutions, understand what concerns are, ask what people would like to have, also more importantly what people would not like to see. And you can see the list is sort of a, a remnants of what was above. Next slide, please. So let's talk about this as an opportunity. Back in 2007, as Councilperson Hussein was uh, talking about closing the golf course. Nine-hole golf course in its day it served quite a few people. I believe it was started in 1908. Um, it was situated along the banks of the Red Cedar. At that time, Lansing was a very small town. Uh, the Michigan Avenue corridor wasn't sort of the connector piece that we see its possibility that it is today. And looking back from where we began this process in 2011, there was an RFQP that was put out and trying to figure out how to interact or interface with the environment and the issues as well as the challenges that exist as well as understanding what those opportunities are. Next slide, please. So when we talk about this partnership and we talk about working and moving forward and where we began and how we got to where we are today and hopefully moving forward, we talk about a common interest. We talk about the economic as well as the community impacts. Economics being what it is that we can develop on this site that will allow sort of a piece that sort of sets off or continues to, to move the corridor forward to continue the connection out to Williamstown Township down to the Michigan <coughs> State Capitol. Also, of course, leaking, uh, excuse me, linking the region, not only east and west, but also north and south along the I-27 or 127 corridor. We also would like to include that we're a, sort of a mid-sized city and as we continue to move forward, we hopefully continue to grow, and we believe that this is one of those opportunities for a, a step forward in terms of that growth. Next slide, please. That's a visual of the entire site looking north towards Frandor. We'll go into the actual components of it when we get to the site plan, but just briefly on the left-hand side is the western edge of the site. Oh. We skipped one. Could you go back one slide, please? Just working our way west from the left-hand corner of the edge of the, of the image is the market rate as well as retail on the first floor, which is at Clifford and Michigan Avenue. To the south of that is the Senior Village. Moving east to the right, hotels, more market rate housing, and then we have uh, more retail along the street level the IPS structure is, exists underneath the hotels, and then we have a uh, student housing component that we've moved to that edge uh, right as you come out of Frandor at Morgan Lane. Okay, next slide. So we talk about leveraging cooperative economic development, how there's a win-win opportunity, not only for the developers and the city, but the developers and the community the developers and the county, as well as the state, looking at ourselves as a region and looking at selves, ourselves as an opportunistic community that takes advantage of what we have in front of us. And again, this is an abandoned golf course that sort of in the day served its purpose but has become obsolete. 
uh, transparent and open partnerships that goes back to the P3 relationships that we talked about before, be it with Williamstown Township, be it with LEAP, be it with um, the East Side community, um, met with the Adam Hussein's, Councilperson Hussein's community. Uh, so we try to sit at the table, we've, we've tried to put ourselves in front of questions, in front of dialogue, um, and there's been pushback, there's been acceptance, there's been excitement, um, and there's been, there's been anger. So we've tried to take all of those things and put them together and try to move this project and this process forward. Uh, heritage and recovery, again, I talked about the uh, history of the golf course, and again, here we are at a point where we have a location, but we don't necessarily have a site that's buildable, and we'll go into that further. And that would lead us to new opportunities, new revenue, and a new region. Next slide, please. And this is a list. We're trying to attract employers and visitors through the development, residents that would not otherwise visit this in the city of Lansing. We're increasing jobs and earnings for Lansing residents. We're attempting to increase outputs for Lansing businesses, create a 20-acre public park to the south, create open space and connections to the Lansing River Trail system, create additional tax revenues for public use by local governments, both in Lansing and the county, and that's even after taking into account potential um, tax incentives, levies a hotel tax to support marketing promotion of the region, trying to increase the density and economic activity along the important Michigan Avenue corridor, and establish the largest mixed-use development tax base for a single project in Lansing history on property that currently generates zero tax dollars. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Uh, let me start out. I, it's a little awkward with the way we're configured here for three of us, but uh, I want to thank everyone on behalf of Frank Cass um, and Joel. And I, I've been here uh, with Continental for five years, and my entire time has been work, at least involved in this project in some form or another. And uh, so with that, I you know, would like to thank Bob and Carl for their efforts over the years, and of course the mayor's office and city council for your patience on this project. I believe this is the third time I've presented to you all in some form or another. Um, as recently as last February of 2018, we had a project presentation with Frank sitting up here and Chris uh, trying to identify for you what the <coughs> scope of the project is. And over the course of the past 12 months, 13 now I suppose, um, we've worked through with Bob and his team and trying to get a, a resolution for a project that works. And I believe we're there now. So um, what I'd like to present to you is just for relative purposes, because it, I can't go through all the iterations of changes, we'll be here all night, but just from what's changed for you from the last time around that we met, uh, which was last February. Um, just overall scope, if you recall, this project's about, I'll say 35 acres, 32, 35 acres, somewhere in that uh, magnitude. And originally, when we started this concept five years ago, we had a total of infrastructure development to make the project work as we had planned at that time, upwards of $150 million. Um, we since working with Bob and our, our engineering team and everything else have gotten that down to 54, and I'll let Eric dive into the numbers and how that's financed and, and worked out for the scope of the project, but from here, uh, and last year, if you recall, we had a project that encompassed the entire 35 acres. And we still do, but what we have done uh, as part of this value engineering and, and getting this project to work is, uh, for lack of a term, create density and pull the project up to the streets of Michigan and Clippert and got, have gone taller. So now our buildings are all at least five story all the way across the board and have the different uses I'll explain here in a minute. But the big thing, there's a couple big things that you should uh, understand that we've changed. Um, originally, if you recall from last year's presentation, we had an assisted living project that was at the corner of Clippert and Michigan, tucked into the corner, and now, you know, hearing the comments over the past year and trying to make the appropriate changes, we have now have created a, uh, assist, uh, a site that activates that corner with a on-street commercial that has some retail components, and then above that would be some multifamily um, that would also be a part of the project. The assisted living has then slid south 
Um, if you could go back to the slide, leave it there for a minute. Um, and, and that would be at the southern half of the western portion, right along Clippert. That assisting living project still is in scope, but now it's five story. Um, in the middle, uh, what, you know, and I call the middle, if you look at where the building structures are identified on the project, along, um, or building C, tough to see with the images, but uh, the right on Michigan Avenue would be a hotel, uh, dual brand, so there's two hotels there with a shared common area. And then just south of that would be part of the first phase of student housing. On the eastern half of the, the building block, there would also be on Michigan Avenue, again, engaging the street with a mixed use retail and student housing, uh, again, up against Michigan Avenue. And then just to kind of reinforce this, this is a, as part of the second phase of the project, there would be additional uh, student housing to the south of the eastern portion of student housing. Um, the parking um, for the project will obviously be integrated into the development. We do have a, a portion of the parking that would be to the east of the prop or east of kind of where the structures are. Uh, that would serve as the student housing parking. I think based on our discussions with our student housing partners, we believe that functions well with the way uh, students interact with campus using the, the bus system uh, and scooters and biking. Um, I guess the last kind of important thing to talk about on the site plan specifically is relative to where the IPS is or the integrated parking structure. That is in the middle and it would support the hotel and the portion of the first phase of the student housing. Um, so then I guess the, the, the other thing that uh, is really important to talk about and I believe the lady discussed it earlier in the comment period is, is the actual floodplain and how that's accommodated. Um, this overall development is within the floodplain. Uh, Michigan Avenue in the 100 year event uh, would be six foot underwater. What we have done with our project and our concept is to protect the site up to the 10 year event um, which is basically by that southern road. And for lack of a better description, it serves as a dike to protect that parking and then all the buildings are lifted above the 100 year event by 18 inches. So that, that does meet you know, regulations with FEMA and also with the state uh, DEQ. And then I guess uh, Christopher just mentioned to me that it's important to identify access points to the site. Our main access point uh, will be a signalized intersection at the center of the development off of Michigan Avenue. What's that? Morgan Lane. Yeah, with, aligned with Morgan Lane. It'll be a brand new signal that we would install there as part of the project to help facilitate traffic movements. A secondary uh, access point would be off Clippert uh, along the west side of the project. We would then have a right in, right out uh, interior to the project that would be off of Michigan Avenue separating on the roadway that's separating the, uh, the multifamily component and the uh, hotels. The last point of access for vehiculars would be through uh, the eastern access point over by the, the what's the name of that road? Renegar Court. Uh, Renegar Court that would connect into East Lansing. We also have a pedestrian route for the students into uh, Michigan State through Brody on the east side. And, and a connection to the river trail. So I guess she's flipped over to the next page. This is good. Th this is the on the next slide there is the IPS structure and how it works. As you can see, it's reflective of the, the roadway on the south side. That is what the equivalent of the 10 year event would be and how it relates to the IPS. So we would protect floodwaters up through there. You know, I guess furthering the point, you know, on site as in coordination with the drain commissioner's improvements, we would be building additional floodplain to offset those impacts. But then secondarily, any impacts we have on site would be addressed and taken care of in an off-site property in Williamstown Township, which I think Christopher touched on. The idea would be working with the DEQ, the drain commissioner, and the city to make sure that the, in the end there is net zero impacts on the floodplain for the overall project. And, and if not, we would ha have an offset where we have additional floodplain in the event of a flood. 
And then additionally, I think to just address one more question, as part of the permitting process for all structures uh, through the city and the state for that matter, there is a earthquake zone component that's contemplated. Uh, that design would basically allow for or protect against a certain earthquake zone, whatever is designated for the area. We've hired the best structural engineers and geotechnical engineers here in the state to make sure that, that, hap that we're protected against that. So the, the, the last thing, just to, to touch on it, you know, that obviously a big concern for us and, and ideally what we're trying to do is eliminate risk to our development uh, and to protect the residents is that during floodplain or, or storm events where there would be an impact with flooding, we will be working with the drain commissioner to uh, identify an early warning system for our residents and the area that in the event of a flood, uh, it's been studied, this, the red cedar has been studied to a point that generally you have a notification process of 24 hours in advance of that impact. We would also set up an emergency uh, access plan with the city coordinating the, uh, that process to get that approved and that's also part of the DEQ permit that we already have with the state where in the end uh, we would be able to relay, relocate those vehicles that would in the end be net impacted by the flood. That way those residents are protected. Next slide, please. Okay, um, now that you have an idea of the big picture, I'm gonna go through some of the numbers that are specific to the development itself, um, how we're gonna make all of this work, and then ultimately how we're gonna pay for this. Um, so the slide that's, uh, very next slide please. This is a graph that shows you from our perspective. This is more from the developer's perspective, and I want to explain this and is why it's reflected as a negative number in our mind. We're showing $54 million that is needed in order to basically build what's necessary to get us above the floodplain, deal with the environmental costs and the infrastructure costs in order to make this project reality. Uh, from a developer's perspective, we look at about two hundred dollars to $300,000 an acre. Uh, if this was out in a greenfield, uh, if we are not in this particular situation. And in our situation, because of the, the costs that are involved in order to develop this property, and this would be facing anybody, uh, whether it's our team or another team, and why it's taken us so long to be here, is we're about $1.5 million an acre to make this land developable. So the need for incentives is great. The project would not happen without incentives uh, and requires the 30-year brownfield plan that we've uh, asked for. Um, so once that project uh, in the infrastructure, site preparation, uh, the environmental is completed, that then allows the site to go vertical. Uh, and then that vertical component is about $200 million. So the overall, that's how you get to the overall budget that we have for this project of $250 million. Uh, next slide, please. One of the things that we've learned through the various meetings is especially this weekend, um, and which became very important for us to, to explain, and we take this for granted because we've lived this for so many years. We work very carefully with LEAP, and Bob knows this very well. This, is a, this was a point of uh, a significant discussion, uh, both with the prior administration as well as the current administration, um, is that the city originally, back in 2014, had an up to amount of $38 million for a general obligation bond that was committed to in, in the purchase agreement. And that carried a purchase price of 7.2 million. Well, if you look at it from a standpoint of what the, uh, the cost versus net benefit uh, to the city was, is that it had a negative uh, number attached to it of, of close to $31 million. And you can see that in the graph. And that's what that, that blue indication shows as a negative to the city. Uh, so that is a general obligation bond that would have been requiring the full faith and credit of the city back solely by the city uh, in order to pay for that work. In 2017, that was renegotiated to $10.7 million. And as consideration for the loss of the city's backing to help with the infrastructure costs, uh, the purchase price was then reduced to $2.2 million. That would then brought the, the negative number uh, down uh, to a, a negative 8.5 from the city's perspective of cost uh, that they were gonna basically have to carry. Uh, and then in 2019, that was even further negotiated, which is brings us today to where we are at uh, with a $0 amount, no general obligation bond on the part of the city. 
So no, you, the, your full faith and credit is protected. You can do other capital improvement projects and, and move forward. Uh, the purchase price did stay the same, however, because the deal was supposed to close in December uh, in consideration of that and, and the small amount of raw land lost taxes, the taxes were added in. That's why you see that subtle but, bump up uh, to 2.21 million there. Um, so now it's a net positive to the city uh, without carrying that general obligation bond requirement uh, toward the infrastructure improvements and site preparation costs. So uh, this, this, I felt, was an important slide to add. This is one of the new things uh, that we learned over, over the weekend and, and had uh, a couple of questions very specific to this. Uh, next slide, please. So as far as the public investment goes now, and we look at source of funds as the investment, where the general bond obligation bond was one of those sources early on of up to $38 million, and that being eliminated now to 2019 down to zero, there still is a small amount of public investment uh, that is being brought uh, that I didn't want to forget about and just ignore. Um, but we're sharing in the cost of the removal of a, a piece of infrastructure that the Lansing Border and Water Light um, has uh, agreed to split the cost on. They were originally were going to do this uh, work themselves at their full cost, but we've ex asked them to accelerate that process in order for us to uh, allow us to go to development this fall. Um, and so we're sharing in that cost. So the entire amount of the development is, is privately backed uh, and uh, the investment uh, from the private sector. Uh, next slide, please. This builds on what Jason was talking about as far as a little bit of a summary on where the dollars go and the changes from the last time you saw this project. And I, want, I do want to go through this because I think it is important by the numbers to know what has been increased and decreased by in the form of uh, unit counts or beds or hotel keys and so forth. Um, with the site preparation number, again, of 54 million, uh, privately financing nearly 54 of that, 49 million, which you'll see in a later slide, the breakdown of, of costs, of higher costs for this, uh, 49 million is actually being reimbursed with the Brownfield TIF. Uh, again, through discussions and negotiations, uh, 4.62 million of eligible costs are not being reimbursed by the Brownfield plan. So those have been pulled out uh, and those will be bared uh, solely by the development. Um, we will be utilizing non-recourse uh, uh, bonds. Uh, these are 100% developer backed uh, and we use tax increment revenue through the Brownfield plan in order to uh, size those bonds accordingly. And I'll break that down here in a second slide. Um, we also have pre maintained the prevailing wage commitment, um, and that is for all 54 million of the project for the infrastructure, site prep, and environmental. Um, and then there's the publicly financed piece. I'll walk through a few of the changes on the vertical construction, the $196 million. Um, we have maintained the full service hotel at 152 rooms, so there's no change to the room count uh, for that building. Uh, select service has increased by 16 rooms, and we are now up to 128 rooms on the select service hotel. Multifamily housing has decreased um, by 50 units, so we are at uh, 150 in totality. Uh, student housing has also dropped by 148. We are now at 1,100 beds. Uh, and to build on what Jason explained, uh, one major change from what we did the last time is, is that we are building the student housing in two phases. Uh, again, this came up, you know, just based on the amount of student housing that's being built in, in the, in the uh, area. Um, by the time we get out of the ground, are we gonna be able to fill all of these beds? And so uh, the development team is fir firmly aware of what's going on and we'll be watching that carefully. Phase one will be 600 beds and phase two is 500 beds. And I'm going to ask, I'm basically going to answer the question that's probably on other people's minds. What happens if we do not build the 500 beds on the second phase? We're clearly going to have a good piece of property. Uh, the market, uh, they're continuously uh, evaluating the market. There may be an opportunity for office, uh, maybe some more market rate housing itself, uh, another mixed use building, but that building pad will not go undeveloped. It, um, so uh, we fully understand that there will be a uh, greater, greater opportunity there. Um, last item, uh, last two items I should say, there's the assisted living memory care facility that has increased slightly by uh, additional Karen? four units. Yes. Okay. 
We're not there yet. Okay, never mind. Okay, okay. sure. Um, and then on the active senior, uh, which you had seen in the prior plan, which was uh, the 55 and older product, uh, we have eliminated uh, that, that piece of the development completely, so it is no longer in the plan. Council Member Spitzley. Yep. Why is that? You want to answer that? Yeah, I think it's market driven is the big thing. It was we're working with our partner developers and we go through the process. Uh, we believe that we felt working with them that there are better opportunities. What Eric skipped over and I think it's just more an accident. We did increase the retail space on site um, a, as a means to help offset some of that. And then um, you know we fully believe as part of this development moves forward there could be potential for other opportunities down the road on the eastern half of the site to help additionally offset the infrastructure. Councilmember Spitz, or Councilmember Spadafore. Well, now I have a question. Thank you, Madam President. You mentioned phase two of the student housing project will or will not happen. I mean, that's a different question altogether, but will that parking lot, um, which it looks like there's a lot of parking space now there versus development, will that parking lot um, on the east side of the property require an integrated parking structure to build up? Or are you going to come back to us in five years and say we need another brownfield for these 15 acres? Well, uh, under the current concept, no, we do not need to do that. What I think we believe is a potential for this pro property is that there are other opportunities to develop it. And in the event that, uh, for instance, let's say an office user came along or um, some additional student housing or whatever, I mean, or senior active living, senior, active, active senior, we would potentially need that opportunity to come back for an integrated parking structure. So, so we can sustain a parking lot, but nothing else without another incentive or substantial correct. investment. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Jackson. Thank you. Um, when we're looking at the 10 year flood and the 100 year flood, I guess my question is would the project be worth it if we are in a state of 10-year flood more often than we are now. Um, basically, would it still be viable if, if it's like an 11-year flood and it peaks over the top of that hill and then into the parking lot where you have to you know, move the people up or whatever it is, and it's like that more than you planned? Well, I think, I think there's a couple things that you're asking there. The, in general, the structures themselves and everything else are out of the way. But in the event of 10-year flood, all of Michigan Avenue is encompassed with water. Uh, we're flooding up into Frandor. I mean, it, you've lived here much longer than I've even had the opportunity to visit. How many times have that happened in, in your lifetime? My guess is very little. Um, the, the only time that I'm aware of, at least based on the conversations with the drain commissioners once, which is back in the 70s. So I, I think ideally, uh, if it were constantly a 10-year flood, they would change what that event is, and it would no longer be a 10-year event. Um, but the reality is we, we feel like it's worth the risk to proceed, mm -hmm. and that we can make the project work protecting up to the 10-year event. If I can had a follow-up on that. Okay, so were there any discussions about, back at it again, climate change and the frequency of 10-year events coming more often, so on and so forth? Because I guess, basically, wouldn't you, if you had accounted for that, wouldn't you find that 10-year events will happen more often? Certainly that would be a concern, but it, I'm also under the impression based on some conversations I heard from my engineering friends, and you know, not that those are the most exciting things to talk about, but there are other improvements that are down the road that would actually help lower the floodplain elevation upstream and downstream. So um, realistically, you know, we're, we're anticipating that to come down um, based on some of the, the working improvements that at least that's been discussed in the future. So I, I believe, and, and I guess maybe we need to have the city engineer discuss it, but I believe there's a floodplain study in the works now or will be in the, in the coming years to uh, fully evaluate the stream and, or the river and how it operates. 
And can I add to this too, please? Um, this goes back to the partnerships that we had. We've spent a significant amount of time. It was probably six months working with the DEQ, uh, and you know, through their expertise and through their modeling, you know, they only can use what's in front of them and everything that they have is current. So, to your point about climate change, of course, it's something that we have to consider. Um, but to Jason's point about all of the improvements in the totality, not just what is, ex is existing and potentially happening on this site, but what's happening upstream, what's happening north uh, in the Montgomery Drain District, all has an effect on how that water moves and interacts with the land. Um, and I would also, uh, also be able to say, too, that climate change can also mean drier conditions. So the assumption of things getting more wet or more frequent, we don't know. I mean, it's, it, it, but it is definitely a consideration that was brought up the other day, I believe, at Councilperson Hussein's that it's something we have to consider, but it's also like looking around the corner, we're not sure. Um, but all of the engineers and the ingenuity and the information and the experts that we've sat with, what we're doing is exactly what is recommended based upon the modeling and the understanding and the science that they have current today. Count, Council Member Spitzley. Thank you, Madam President. So I'm going through the, uh, the amended agreement and I'm looking at page 16 um, and setting aside the whole active senior multifamily housing that you've eliminated, um, which I just, I, I, I don't understand that. But, um, you know, I'm looking at the language here and, 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 and particularly the language under student housing. And it says, shall consist of at least you know, so you're at least going to put 1,100 beds, but that means you could put more beds and you don't have to come back here and say anything because, you know, you could decide, you could decide, you know, some of the surplus space on there that you might want to put a, another 1,000 beds there and you, and, and you would be well within the agreement to do that. Well, the agreement's one thing, but coming back to you is going to be required uh, if we are able to build this, and let's say it was another 1,000, okay, just using your example. The only way the project would work with is another integrated parking structure. And with that integrated parking structure would trigger another uh, brownfield plan amendment. Uh, it wouldn't be a new plan. It would be amending this existing plan. Um, and it'd have to work. Uh, we'd have to build enough in order to support that added cost. So if well, this it could work if you eliminated the assisted living memory care facility and the multifamily housing and just put student housing because the, because the yeah. agreement allows you to do that. The agreement does not allow us to, to take another product and eliminate it to it put another product there. Oh, yes, it and does. Can it does the, the agreement does not say must. The agree, the, I, I disagree with that. I think the agreement does allow you to do that. Councilman I, I, I hate to interrupt you, yes, but we will have an opportunity to argue the agreement. Right now, we're looking at well, the I, and the only reason I mentioned okay. it is and because I appreciate the, that. the slide says yeah. one thing, no. and I'm looking at the agreement, and so I just want to make sure. And, I apologize for that. Okay. I jumped. No, in. no, no. That's okay. And, and to that point, it was what was required to us through the negotiations with the city attorney and our attorneys that that was put in there. Councilmember Dunbar. Um, <clears throat> on the issue, I'm not going to talk about climate change from the standpoint of the weather because um, they're not related. Um, but from the standpoint of sustainability, is there any component of this that is using sustainable materials? Are you looking for any certifications? what kind of components went into this, or is that just not possible given the scope of this project? Well, when we work with our partner developers, a lot of times we pursue lead. I don't know if you know what that is, but, yeah. It, yeah. but that is a portion of the project that we will not get it certified, but at least, or I won't guarantee we'll get certified, but we will go through and identify lead points and meet those lead points so that down the road, if we so choose, we could go get lead certified. Specifically, I can reference the hotel. Our hotel partner is um, um, very interested in, in having sustainability and getting those, uh, you know, the, the opportunity to go pursue that. We've worked with them on eight projects now, and every project that we do, we do have lead certified buildings. So it is something that we would obviously pursue and make sure that we um, 
are sustainable, not necessarily going after meat, though, for each product. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I can also assure you that our construction team likes to um, maintain and get recyclable materials, recycle any waste products that come from the overall project. That is part of our, our company's perspective. Okay. And I guess the other thing that I'm going to, just to comment on, as far as the, I, I am concerned um, about the change from active adult housing to just um, assisted living. Because I, I, I had envisioned it to be somebody that could age in place, like somebody that empty nest, got in this like crazy awesome little city that really didn't have to leave. You can get your groceries and all your entertainment and what have you kind of in one spot and then move into an assisted situation. And I feel like without that part, the assisted living seems awkwardly placed in the middle of this otherwise independent living scenario. It, it, just to be clear, the assisted living project has remained in, in, in this system or whatever. I think what you're asking for is the active seniors, those 98 units that, that are no longer identified in the project. We still have 150 one and two bedroom uh, apartments available there that are adjacent to. I, I think it's just a, intended not to restrict to different residents, but it, you know, certainly an active senior could live adjacent to this assisted living project. We're just not clearly marketing to active seniors. Okay. All right. Uh, th those are restrictions um, on, on the other building that was originally proposed uh, when they have to be 55 and older. So, um, I'll continue on. Yeah, we're on slide 17. Yes, slide 17, please. As she's pulling up slide 17, I will just start. Um, so th this goes to the funding sources. These are the buckets, so to speak, um, that we, we've talked about in various meetings before. Uh, again, originally there was a general obligation bond bucket that has been eliminated. Uh, and so now we are dealing with a tax exempt bond and, and a taxable bond. Both of these bonds, yet similar, are different in a couple of ways, and I'll just point those out in the interest of time. The tax exempt bond uh, allows us to get a lower interest rate. So anything that is deemed uh, public uh, can fall into, into that source of funds and carries a lower interest rate. And that's less risk to the, to the investors uh, and is also privately backed. The taxable bond uh, does carry a higher interest rate. So obviously for the project as a whole uh, and the brownfield plan, the lower we can reduce interest, um, the less we're paying to Wall Street and the more opportunity there is to pay this off sooner uh, than the 30 years that are projected in the brownfield plan. Uh, and then the third bucket that we have is our private sources, and I put them into one bucket, but really there's a number of different sources within the private sources. Uh, first and foremost, there's developer equity. Everything up to this date has been uh, equity, ash on hand uh, to, to spend on the project. And then the next main item is uh, privately secured loans. So there is a substantial amount of the infrastructure uh, as well as all of the vertical uh, component, the 200 million, um, that will generally fall into to the private sources bucket. Uh, next slide, please. I'm not intending on going through all of this. It is quite small, uh, but I was asked to provide uh, the, the detailed breakdown of when each product type uh, was going to be built, uh, which also then added into when were each of the different parking components going to be built. Generally speaking, the parking uh, is the first to go in because it's related to the site, the site improvements, uh, specifically the integrated parking structure. So that's the first that will be constructed in order to allow the buildings to be built themselves. Uh, but not everything is on an integrated parking structure. So the property to the far west, both the market rate housing and the, uh, the senior uh, assisted living, not being on IPS, can start much sooner after site preparation. Um, the, the product types to the east immediately uh, from the integrated parking structure where the hotels are, um, are no longer on uh, an integrated parking structure, but due to timing and the construction of the integrated parking structure uh, will be built relatively at the same time. The only thing that you'll see here that's really important to call out is the this final phase, uh, which is the student housing phase two, uh, which brings the uh, end of construction to 23, uh, 2023. Otherwise, it would end by 2022. Next slide, please. 
Um, obviously, uh, current jobs uh, on, the, on the site right now are zero. Um, the future estimated jobs uh, are 397. These are full-time equivalent jobs. So this is a combination of full-time jobs and part-time jobs that add up to one full-time equivalent job. Uh, so a total of 397. Uh, induced jobs are the jobs that are basically like the spin-off jobs, the supportive service jobs. And these are jobs that uh, are there. They're normally done by, by local companies, service type companies, and everything from landscape maintenance uh, to, to laundry service, you name it. Anything that you can think of that could support all of these various different buildings uh, in the products that are being built there. Next slide. So I'm gonna go into the brownfield plant now. Um, and uh, break that down a little bit further so you know what you're looking at. Um, next slide. This slide talks about the eligible property. Uh, the parcel of land in, in particular that is being acquired is 35.57 acres. It is one parcel of land. Uh, all of the land uh, does qualify uh, as a brownfield, being that it's contaminated or a facility uh, under the state of Michigan. Um, and that is the balance of that land, which is, goes up to the river south of that far yellow line, uh, would be the approximate 20 uh, or more acres, depending on where you measure the meandering line of the river, uh, would be the park. Uh, next slide. Current taxes paid obviously are zero, uh, publicly owned property. Uh, when the project is completed, based on that schedule I just mentioned, starting uh, in 2024, which is when the first amount of taxes will be generated, uh, the first year of uh, taxes are three point, about $3.54 million. Uh, that's based on a taxable value of nearly $53 million. And Council Member Spadafore. What taxes are included in that $3.5 million? Yep, um, we're, we're counting uh, our all real property, okay? So real property being the land improvements and buildings and the personal property. Majority of the personal property is contained uh, in the uh, hotels themselves and the commercial properties. Uh, much of the personal property and way personal property tax law is uh, may become exempt, so we did not want to overstate taxes related to that. There is a probability, depending on what they actually put into the building itself for personal property, could become available and raise that number, but I would look at this number as pretty conservative. Let's take the PPT out of it. What's the real property taxes? What, um, what, I what are the taxes that are paid yeah, that are I, collected? I, could, I can answer that uh, later for you. It's in the Brownfield Plan and have that breakdown okay, for you. thanks. Yep. Okay, um, current tax revenues obviously uh, are zero, but there are gonna be new tax revenues that are gonna be available for public use, um, totaling a little more than $17 million. And this is over the entire term of the Brownfield Plan, the, uh, the 30 years. Next slide. Breaking down that 17 million, the first group that I'd like to look at uh, are taxes that are generated, they're not captured. So these are net new taxes over a 30 year period based on the city's debt mills that are in place currently that amounts to just less than a half million dollar. Um, and then the uh, next two mills, the debt mills are related to school, uh, a little more than uh, $8.3 million. So again, these are taxes that are paid, but not uh, available for capture. Uh, Council Member Spadafore. So these are, this 8.9 million is included in your anticipated expenditures of $17 million in new tax revenue? That first 8.9 is our new taxes that are part of the 17. Are you aware that the 2.4 mills in the Lansing School District debt expires before this project is going to sh be shovel ready? In all brownfield plans, we ex expect mills to be renewed. That is the way the state wants us to look at them and anticipate it continues and carries forward. Uh, so if that does not happen, even though they're not capturable uh, by the brownfield plan, it does not impact the plan. It does impact the schools. From the standpoint, they don't have any more mills to, to have passed on. So the taxes wouldn't be paid on that, but they're not captured by the Brownfield. Right, but there's not $17.2 million. There, there wouldn't be, but also I don't know what's gonna happen over the next 30 years. Taxes generally increase, don't decrease. So they're actually that number in our experience uh, over since the inception of the Brownfield plan since 1996, taxes have always r rose in most every jurisdiction ex except for a few. Um, so they actually are higher and they would expect it to be be much higher for a benefit. 
history on the school district, debt millage would not prove that case. Um, Probably right on the schools. That is that is true. Okay. I'm just wondering if there's room in there to exempt something like the SET in the city of Lansing so that the schools will still receive some of those dollars so as the, part of the plan since there is about a $220,000 annual payment. Yeah, so the millages that are captured and identified um, have been predicated and allocated within the Brownfield plan are needed. Um, actually, the very if we could go to the next slide, I kind of want to address this simultaneously with your question. Um, and the next public benefit slide, which is slide 25, please. Thank you. Um, so there's other fees and, and other captures that we are often asked to look at. Um, we cannot be exclusive on pass-through under a brownfield plan. Whatever we do to one taxing jurisdiction, we have to proportionately pass on to the next. Unlike TIFAs and DDAs and LDFAs, which can have opt-out provisions, uh, there's no opt-out provision and we cannot negotiate individual taxing jurisdictions. So we are set by the captures that are allowed. So if we were to, on the SCT, uh, pass through uh, anything on the SCT, we'd have to do that in a proportionate share to every millage. Uh, there would not be enough taxes to allow this project to move forward. So why I call your attention to the next slide, and it's kind of a good segue, is this was also an important point of discussion through the negotiations. Um, typically, the, the current policy um, in working with LEAF and working with the Brownfield Authority, and I can let uh, Carl or, or, or Bob speak to this, is a 10% uh, pass-through to all taxing jurisdictions and a 10% uh, amount which is split uh, up to the Brownfield Authority into an administrative fee uh, and to their Brownfield Revolving Fund. Um, unfortunately, because of the uh, amount of uh, capture that's needed in order to allow this project to move forward, uh, those were reduced uh, down to two and a half and two and a half or a 5% net uh, to the Brownfield Authority. The three mills that you see here, uh, a 4.3 million um, projected, uh, are non-negotiable and that's just due to state law. They allow, they require those three mills to pass on to their Brownfield Redevelopment Fund. Uh, so there's an additional 8.4 nearly going through to, to these uh, entities. They're captured but redistributed unlike the other slide that is non-captured. Go ahead. So my question then I guess goes back to, you can't give me the SET, but you're gonna not spend $4.3 million. Does this mean you pay off the brownfield faster? What, what, where does that $4.3 million? It's just a tax that doesn't get paid. So I understand it, that, but you're anticipating to pay it, so there's an expense somewhere in there that's not being expended, so where does it go? Well, we're looking at the amount that we are paying, so even though we are paying that, if, if we have to use these taxes elsewhere. So I, I don't, I'd have to talk to our bond people to see if there was any maneuvering on that, uh, but the only opportunity to reduce anything would be on the slide that we're talking about here in slide 25, um, but that isn't gonna be able to come back. You can't redistribute it back to any taxing jurisdiction out of this fund. So I guess, cause that's my question is, you're predicating the viability of this project on $18 million in taxes that'll be paid alongside everything else that goes with it. There's actually a shortfall of greater than $5 million on this project. Uh, so what you're asking is adding to the shortfall. Um, uh, you'll see in another slide that, that is coming up here um, that that was a, a, an item that we had to reduce because that, that shortfall was even greater uh, based on the other plan. Uh, it was one of the reasons why that plan was non-buildable. Um, there's just no way we can add to, to any further any, any further uh, reduction in capture in order to make the project move forward. I guess maybe I'm not saying it clearly. You're anticipating to spend $8.9 million on school district and city of Lansing debt. I'm telling you when 2021 rolls around and these 2.4 mills come off the tax, tax rolls, there's gonna be $4.3 million you've expected to spend over 30 years. What happens to that if those mills don't get removed? So how does it affect the, the Brownfield plan? How does it affect this whole financing situation? The doesn't impact doesn't impact at all the plan. So the developer gets that four million dollars. Developer doesn't get a dime. <laughs> developer <laughs> never had it to begin with. They're the developer. Paying it. The, They're presuming to pay it. No, the the hotels, the commercial operators, those entities uh, that are built upon it would be paying that. 
So it impacts their performa. That's just less tax that they are paying. But since we weren't relying on as developers to build the development, because we're the master developer in the development, since we don't, we don't have to rely on those taxes because it was never allocated to begin with. It was never accounted for. So it affects the business model. It affects the, the business models of each individual product. And their viability. Correct. And in the case of some of the product types, this is a good thing in the event. Bob, Bob, would, I know you're itching to get in there. Maybe. But let's do it on the mic. <laughs> I think, I think what Eric was trying to demonstrate is that there is this, this amount of money of tax revenue that is going to flow through and not be captured correctly. The, there's, yeah, there's two slides. The slide 25 yeah, is that. The school that yeah, one flows through is slide 24. <coughs> That's a flow through, correct. Slide 25 is captured, but yet redistributed. Right. Well, I just, so sorry. when that millage ends, like you're suggesting in 2022? 2021. 2021, it, it's not being captured and used in the project, correct? No, not at all. What you were trying to show is that there's revenue. Now, I think where possibly we made an error is not in this calculation of showing revenue passing through. We should It should be lower because that's going to stop that revenue. Well, somewhere along the line, someone assumed those taxes were going to be paid, so their business model and viability of the products were based upon those $4 million in taxes over 30 years. Does there were primary. the viability of the business plan. That is true. And in, in some of the product types cases, this is good news. Uh, and if there is no additional school debt being added, uh, because they, they are actually in, in, in a relatively neutral uh, uh, several years for stabilization, um, other product types uh, do better uh, than, than others on the project. So that is actually good news for those particular projects. Um, in others, it will help them. That is correct. Okay. Okay. So uh, if we go to a slide uh, 26, thank you. Um, we talked about the first three bullets. I won't belabor those. Um, let's go to, we'll go to the fourth bullet. Uh, so we uh, uh, co uh, contracted Anderson Economic Group. Uh, they did a, a fiscal study, an economic impact statement, so to speak, as you can, you can say it. And we asked them to look at specifically uh, the impact of this project uh, on the city of Lansing and, and Lansing residents only. So they did not look at the region uh, as a whole. Um, we had a very narrow focus. So I just want you to uh, uh, keep that in mind. But we were asked uh, by who, who was that council? I believe it was yeah, some council member uh, to to focus on Lansing. Um, so during the we broke this down uh, from the study. Uh, what happens over the four-year construction period? So there's actually an increased output at Lansing businesses of 261.9 million over that four years. Um, so this is impact from the construction for folks that are, are here working, sh uh, shopping, eating, uh, residing. Um, you know doing their normal uh, day's work uh, and then going out in the evenings or staying here through the weekends. Um, there's also the services that they provide the project uh, in, in, in the form of other services that the construction uh, need, the various different contractors need uh, on the project. Um, what does that mean for Lansing residents specifically? Uh, that's 12.2 million uh, from their estimate. The increased employment light Lansing residents during that term, uh, and that is again because of the result of construction only, is 247 jobs. So this is not tied to the full-time equivalent when the project's built. And these are Lansing residents. Uh, increased annual output upon completion uh, at these same Lansing businesses, uh, this is an annual number, is 4.1 million. Uh, or if you want to look at that over the term and not looking at inflation at all, just looking at this relatively flat, 123 million over the 30 years. And then the increased annual earnings of Lansing residents, again, annual is 2.7 million or 81 million over the 30 year period of the brownfield. The increased employment by Lansing residents on an ongoing basis, annual ongoing basis uh, upon stabilization and construction is 113 jobs. And again, that might not sound like a lot, but it is because that is specifically Lansing. Um, being in the location and that this is a regional impact, it actually has a greater impact on jobs. Um, but we do not have that number because we, we did not have them commissioned to answer that question. Um, we want to share the hotel tax revenue, even though that's not specific to Lansing. This is something that they um, often, because there are two hotels, the full service and select service over the 30-year uh, brownfield period, 
that equates to about $15 million. And that $15 million goes to promote the region, it promotes the city as part of that region. So that is money that comes back into the community uh, from that hotel tax, and this is through Ingham County. Uh, city income tax uh, over the 30-year brownfield plan period is 5.31 million, uh, or if you wanna look at that per year of 177,000. And if you break that down by the increase in employment, income tax revenue is 55,000 per year. Total income tax generated by net new residents is 122,000 per year. And it was summarized to me that over this 30-year period, if you were to add all of this up, and I know this is sometimes, it's sometimes hard to, to do, to, to throw numbers together, but if you combine the total earnings and output and taxes, and this is after the incentive, so that, okay, so this is new because of the project, we're looking at greater than uh, $515 million uh, when that's all combined. Next slide, please. So this gets to, I touched on this a little bit, that there was about a $5 million shortfall. The project plan uh, estimates $128 million uh, in eligible activity costs. And in a couple of slides from now, I'm gonna show that breakdown. The uh, estimated potential tax capture in order to repay that is $123 million. So it leaves us a $5 million shortfall. So if uh, taxable value doesn't go up, if there's no added product types, in other words, if there's no other buildings, for example, on the east side uh, of, that, of the development where the parking lot is that you saw, if there's no added taxes, there is a shortfall right now uh, projected. Next slide. Council Member Spitzley. Thank you, Madam President. A shortfall in what? in the co total cost of the eligible activities that are identified in the Brownfield Plan. It's a shortfall to meeting that uh, obligation for those costs. You mean, so, w which would be borne by the developer? It would be borne by the developer. That I, I don't, I don't understand borne. what, then I don't understand what the shortfall is. That's just your cost. It, it's a cost on top of cost. Uh, we identify that specifically when we have plans that run beyond their projected capture amount. Uh, we are required by the act to identify that. Uh, by identifying that, if taxable value did increase, uh, or another thing that could happen, if costs went down, then the obligations of the plan could be met. Um, so it is, it is a, it recognizes a shortfall. So just, from our project performance standpoint, we have to, to include be, that. You know, the statements that there's a shortfall, that the property's not worth anything, that it's worthless. I mean, I, I just. I, I don't believe I said that. I did. What I did say is, to there is a negative value. We have to come up with a way to finance insurmountable costs of about 1.5 million an acre versus any other project that you would go out and oh, okay, a two to three hundred thousand. A negative value. All right. So well, I, I suppose a negative value. Something to else than the property. being worthless. But okay, thank you. Yeah. Council Member Spadafore. Can you help me understand where $128 million comes from versus, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Yep, I don't so actually, if you wait just one more slide, I'll be right on that one, and I can answer those detailed questions for you. It breaks it down for you. It's on slide 29 if you wanted to look ahead in your packet. Um, the slide before that, slide 28, please. If we can come back to 28, just to touch on this real quick. Um, this shows that distribution taxes we talked about already. Uh, in the new taxes available, um, but those are not the net new available for the project. So now we're on slide 29. So the breakdown of the 128 million. So you can see here the total dollar amount that is uh, needed for the project. About 8.4 million of this is pro are monies that do not go to the development project itself. Uh, that's that bottom section uh, starting with the Brownfield Redevelopment Authority administration uh, of 2.009. Um, what is project specific is the $120 million. So if that, for example, that 8.4 wasn't there, um, we wouldn't have to uh, finance or plan to finance the shortfall on the expenses that we need to build the infrastructure uh, and the improvements on the property. So this, is, this shows you where the dollars are currently estimated. This number will be revised, hopefully reduced, 
Um, we are working through construction drawings, and before we get to the state of Michigan, uh, we have to provide an updated uh, cost estimate for the project for them. Vice President Spadafore. So thank you. That th This does explain it a little better. So help me understand this. Uh, all along, I've kind of assumed, I've heard 54 million-ish. Now we're looking at 128 million. How much is actually, f I'll, I'll word this carefully so you don't parse it. How much of this is actually tax revenue that would have gone to the city if the project was existing today? Is that $70 million in interest included in sort of the brownfield forgiveness? If you can, yeah, if you look at the 30 years, if the project was in place and this incentive was done and over or and not, year, and not used, this is not a per year. Uh, this is over a 30-year period, this number. So it's $128 million over a 30-year period of time of, of tax revenue that's not going to the city. That is not, that is correct. Not 54. That is correct. Um, if you look in the area, it says contingency and interest, the numbers that are often uh, not, uh, not looked at, uh, you know, that they're included in the plan. Uh, we have the contingency of 15% of 6.4 million in here. Again, that contingency uh, is only used if needed uh, and approved by the state uh, and the interest the same way of nearly 71 million. The interest that is identified in here, again, uh, looking at this from a conservative approach, from a cost of finance, once we get to the 30% drawings, we'll be able to nail down uh, more uh, accurately the portion that is tax exempt, which will greatly hopefully reduce that interest amount. So the less, again, that we have in the taxable uh, bond versus the tax exempt bond will reduce that. And that would be the parking structure? Uh, that would be roads, mainly roads, water, sewer, and part of the parking structure. Okay. Yep. Anything that's deemed public. Um, we have uh, our own bond advisor, uh, our own bond council. Uh, LEAF has a bond advisor, and the city has their own bond council. So there's four uh, individual uh, groups that will be looking at all of our numbers uh, and looking at that tax-exempt status and taxable status. So you lower that value and lower the interest rate, and whatnot, and so the 128 million becomes less? In it becomes less, exactly. Yeah. The obligation is less. And another thing that we do in that iteration is when we get to 30% drawings, and Jason could maybe talk to this, but um, the contingency amount also gets reduced mm -hmm. because we, ha we have drawings, uh, and we've done uh, a fair amount of engineering already, and we've worked with all the uh, various utility companies, and so that number gets tightened up. So we carry a smaller interest rate as well. Does that mean the, the payback is over a long, shorter period of time? Shorter period of time, exactly. If we don't spend it, we don't need it, we don't want it. We don't want to spend this money. We don't want to even try financing all of this. We want to finance less. And Eric, part of this is the fact you did allude to streets, sidewalks, sewers, which are all given then once they're completed back to the city. Built to city standards, everything. That's the only way it could be included as public. That's correct. Good question, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So we've talked about it pretty thoroughly here. You know, obviously there's a lot of risk, but the developers here are the ones that are on the hook. Um, we fully expect that uh, we can make this project work. We worked with a lot of uh, local consultants, um, engineers, architects, uh, reaching out to the different um, utility providers here in the city and tried to make our best effort at getting a good, accurate cost. And at the same time, we've also engaged uh, bond council, uh, bond consultants, and tried to project a conservative interest rate associated with bonds that would be for our project. And, and obviously, there are things that are a bit out of our control if it's the cycle of the economy, um, you know, find uh, the interest rates change, whatever. But I think we, what we feel like we're sitting here today is that we've made our best effort that we can get to a point where our project works. Um, clearly, you know, from our perspective, it's important for us to get this thing moving quickly. God knows where the economy is going to go, you know, where the interest rates are going to turn. But we feel very confident that we're there. Um, our goal really is to try to move forward and get um, dirt moving in September. 
So it's a massive undertaking at this point from our perspective. We've got our consultants ready and geared up. Um, we're starting to reach out the process with, with everybody across the board, our partner developers, to get them moving on this as well. And in the end, we're going to be really leaning on you guys uh, at the city to help us make this happen. Um, in the end, you know, we're, we're the ones that are, are taking that risk and trying to uh, make this project work, work, which we think it will. So, next slide. Okay. Um, if you finish up um, the word slides, then council members can look at the pretty pictures as we let Bob speak so that we can move forward. <laughs> I, I think we can turn it over to Bob. Okay. Bob. Carl, hey, I will be brief so with the, through those pictures quick too. Um, I just want to thank everybody tonight for being here. First and foremost, our developers, Jason, uh, I don't know how many times he, he could drive it blind, I think up from Columbus. Much appreciated, Jason, for being here. Chris Dukowski has been quite a champion on this project. Much appreciated. And Eric Helzer has been amazing. He knows as much as Carl does about the but these two guys are probably the top uh, brownfield experts uh, with a couple others in the state of Michigan. So <coughs> appreciate all them and Mayor Shore's leadership on this and guiding it through. Uh, I really wanna say thank you. I, just to, to me, there's a fairly simple equation here. One is um, I, I just wanna go back to more, a little bit of stories here. I really appreciate the facts. They're extremely important. And obviously we go through those with, with uh, extreme due diligence, but you know, we do economic development because of our community. The profession is getting mistaken too often as being about the developers and about business. And I just want to remind everybody again, I feel very passionately about this. It's actually not about them. It's they are a means to an end. Our profession was created to benefit a community, to grow our local community and to grow people within the community. That's why we exist. That's why incentives exist. And this particular site, um, is really hindered and damaged the city for um, a really long time. And uh, so has a lot of some of the undeveloped pieces of Michigan Avenue. And so we together uh, through community um, charrettes, there was three of them and a lot of other interaction over a very long period of time, six, seven years, really eight years total. You know, we all decided that uh, a major backbone of our, our economic development efforts here in the city is Michigan Avenue, is connecting a Big Ten University with the capital city of Michigan. And a lot of people constantly, and I do too, talk about our friends in Grand Rapids and Ann Arbor, we wanna be perhaps more like them, and we certainly are well on our way to being like them, but I continue to argue our benchmarks are Columbus and Madison. I mean, those are really the communities that have the assets that we do. Big Ten University, capital city, Fortune 500 National headquarters. That's what they are, and that's what, that, that's what we are. And a common theme is a corridor that is completely connected. And you can have plans and designs and pictures and talk and a lot of meetings, which we have had. But at the end of the day, it is about human psychology and the buildings and the first floors in particular, but the mix of the buildings that keeps the person going along. And in this case, what I mean is taking down a wall and connecting Michigan State University to our capital city. And the only way to do that is to build a flow, a bridge, a connection completely down Michigan Avenue. So just two quick stories along those lines. This pro and that will not happen nor ever happen while there's a third of a mile or whatever it is gap along Michigan Avenue. That's, that's a wall. And, and, and I, you know you've heard this in other presentations, but that actually literally had a, a, uh, a fence with I think barbed wire on it even, separating the campus and, and the city of Lansing. It literally was on that property. This is about tearing down stuff like that. So my brother is from uh, Denver and he was here over the weekend and his son is a freshman in Brody Complex. And my brother spent this weekend um, looking for apartments for his son uh, over this weekend. And they started with Skyview and worked there all the way down to Scott Gillespie's apartment building. Two years ago, not happening. Kid, it's gonna be in Meridian Township or East Lansing with basically 100% certainty. Michigan State University gave, finally, after 25 years I've been in economic development, they finally gave a presentation 
of actual data localized about the, the, the benefits. Here was one that was awesome too. So the city of Lansing has had a huge increase, a 50% jump in employees from Michigan State University living in the city of Lansing over the past few years. They've also, by the way, had a triple the numbers of students who are now staying in our region and working rather than leaving the brain drain. And a lot of these efforts are, if not all of them, are because of our economic development efforts, our sense of place making, and filling in this gap. Finally, today in our office alone, we had developers who are looking at further opportunities to the west of Michigan Avenue. And the Skyview building, by the way, they'll always tell you they only built that building because they are anticipating and wanting the Red Cedar project to be a go. So you can see, and then Frandor will have an enormous, an enormous impact on Frandor. And those are a lot of our, our, those are all our businesses in the city of Lansing. Those are all in the city of Lansing. So I just, you know, I wanted to kind of conclude with this formula. At the end of the day, we started out three, four years, miserable years ago with a $38 million possible price tag to the city of Lansing taxpayer. And then it was reduced to 10.7 million, which is a really good deal. And today it is reduced to zero. And there's been basically, because we've been tenacious, can I say a little bit, but because the developers have, uh, have really worked very, very hard to, um, well, obviously to bring that down and think of solutions that work for everybody, which I really appreciate very, very much. So today we can say that there is absolutely no cost to the city of Lansing taxpayer. There is going to be public financing. I think it should be called that. It's the Brownfield Authority and it's Brownfield Bonds. That is public financing. But there'll be no full faith and credit of the city of the, or the taxpayer or anybody on there. It's totally backed by them. But I believe you should be still contemplated as public financing, but there will be no cost to the city of Lansing taxpayers. So that's this part of the formula. So everything we gain is, uh, is a net gain to the city. Everything from the construction jobs on the city of Lansing um, is going to be a huge benefit. And this is about breaking down barriers and making connections. And the overall city of Lansing is going to be tremendous. Just procedurally, finally, uh, after um, your contemplation and possible passage of this brownfield, it goes on to the Michigan Economic Development Corporation and DEQ, but mainly the MEDC is where we got to go. And there's uh, an ask for um, the state is crucial. Obviously, the state goes along with the brownfield TIF capture, and uh, MEDC, DEQ, we're working that. And then uh, CRP, Community Revitalization Program, is a major ask as well. Um, and then I believe, Eric, it probably, my guess is this all happens in July, August time frame, MSF board approvals. It needs to come back to the Brownfield Authority for final, in pro my guess is hopefully in that time frame as well. Perhaps then we're breaking ground in September on this terrific uh, mixed use project. So I just want to thank everybody. Um, our developers, Carl has been amazing, uh, Mayor Shore. So I appreciate everybody's help and we can answer any questions that will certainly be Adam thank you to your leadership by the way and we'll be at your committee meetings and look forward to trying to answer more questions Peter we will work hard I whispered in Carl we'll work hard on, on with Eric on answering a little bit better maybe that school uh, that that question explain that more clearly okay Councilmember Washington did you have a question uh, just really quickly I've been living this Red Cedar project for the past <coughs> eight years from the putting it on the ballot to today. I've met with every single one of you sitting down there. It hasn't always been pleasant it, it, by any means. But I want to say thank you to the previous administration, Verge Bernaro, and certainly Andy uh, Mayor Shore here. And for my colleagues, I went to every charrette. I, I could give this presentation. <laughs> I have heard it so many times. I neglected thanking you. <laughs> I appreciate all your time. And, and you know, to me, this is what the people voted for with the sale of the property. To me, we desperately need a development on that property. With what we have going on toward the capital and this, I do believe the energy will come in the middle. And I do know, because of meetings I've had with other developers, that we have some really good opportunities coming forward. The economic impact that we were shown tonight is not the only economic impact. They are calling some very good businesses that we want in our city are beginning to call with interest. And I can't neglect the fact that we do know that Skyview has vacancies. 
but that was explained to us over the weekend. Unfortunately for them, they opened at the wrong time. They weren't able to capture the amount of students because they didn't open while students were looking for housing. We do believe that that will catch up, and I'm very grateful that you're gonna build this in two phases because I do worry about a student housing bubble, but I do believe that there are other opportunities should, should that not work. Um, having said that, I, you know, I am still listening to my constituents. I've been listening to them for seven years. I know what the feel is on the east side. I know it well. However, having said that, we will have one last opportunity on April 6th at my constituent um, gathering. Anybody is welcome. It'll be a smaller gathering if you're not comfortable coming to the podium to ask questions one-on-one -on -one of Eric and, and uh, Christopher Stokowski. So I just want to say thank you, Bob. I know it's been a nightmare for you and you, Carl, and everybody else. There's been a lot put into this, and I don't think anybody should take it lightly. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Garza, and then we'll go to Councilmember um, Hussein for a motion. Thank you, Madam President. President, appreciate you guys being here to the, uh, this evening. You know, when we speak about economic development, I think this will be huge for our community, but I really want you guys taking consideration. Unlike Skyview, they use all out-of-state labor. I mean, I'd say 99% of it. You know, please consider using local labor for this project. I mean, the building trades, you know, I know there's a talk that we're short shortage of workers, but it, that's not true. I mean, we can man this job. We can do it on time and under budget. I can guarantee that. So. Uh, I appreciate you guys uh, looking into that, so thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Hussein. Okay, so what we're looking to do is to pass a resolution to set the public hearing for March 25th. Uh, just to give uh, folks a little bit of a timeline, remember back to two, uh, 2000, uh, I'm sorry, July of 2018, Councilwoman Wood uh, stated that this was not our only bite at the apple, and that's certainly true. Um, this has been a very public and transparent process since. Uh, and we're going to continue on um, on that path. So we will take a look at this in terms of the public hearing on March 25th. Uh, it will be referred back to DMP on April 1st, and then it will come back out before council on April 8th. So the development agreement, the amended development agreement, has a different timeline, uh, but this is the timeline that we have established for uh, the brownfield. So with that being said, I would move uh, the resolution to set the public hearing uh, for brownfield plan number 72 for March 25th. All right, we have a motion. I see no hands for any questions or any other concerns at this point. So with that, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Passes unanimously. Gentlemen, you are, you may leave. Um, next is the setting of the public hearing um, for the South Cedar. Council Member Hussein. <sighs> So what we have before us is we actually have a change in date uh, of the public hearing for the rezone at 5400 South um, Cedar. Remember back uh, on February 25th, uh, after a, a very contentious process, uh, we set a public hearing uh, for this rezone request to allow for uh, truck sharing facility, uh, equipment leasing facility, self-storage, uh, et cetera. Uh, we set a public hearing for March 25th. Uh, we actually got a uh, request the next day, we received a request the next day uh, to extend, or I should say delay the public hearing by 60 days. And so what this resolu resolution would do is set a new public hearing uh, date for May 20th um, of, this, of this year. And one of the reasons it was explained to us in development and planning, uh, this team, uh, America Real Estate uh, being the applicant, this team is now looking to engage the public uh, after, again, what was a very contentious process uh, here before um, the City Council. So they have met with the South Lansing Business Association. Uh, they are going to meet separately with the board. Uh, they're working to engage rejuvenating South Lansing. Uh, they're looking at having uh, public meetings on site uh, at 5400 South Cedar. Uh, and so they want time uh, to go through that process before uh, coming back uh, and, and engaging in a public hearing. So with that being said, I would move the resolution to amend uh, the public hearing date for May 20th. All right, we have a motion. Are there any uh, questions or concerns? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. That takes us to general services. Uh, Council Member Washington, we're on B. Um, the first thing we have before us is a claim disposition, claim 1610. This is Amin Falahi 
for 600 and or I'm sorry, $767 in trash fees at 539 Avon Street. Do we have pictures to go with these? There should be coming up. Okay, these are the pictures uh, that we w saw during um, the public hearing, during committee. I'm trying to find my notes on this one. This was the outdoor furniture. Yep. This, the sofas and the outdoor furniture. Just a second. I can't believe this. Anyway, um, it went. It came before uh, general services. It did go before the, the claims review committee. Um, the recommendation is to deny this claim in the amount of seven hundred and sixty-seven dollars. All right. Are there any questions or concerns? Seeing none. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Passes unanimously. Uh, Thank Councilmember Washington. Thank you. The next thing we have before us is claim disposition, claim number 1635. This is Stephen W. Hanks for 1824 in trash fees at 4614 Ballard Street. Um, uh, there would be nothing from it. This is one where uh, we had asked him to come before the committee not once but twice. Uh, he didn't come. He has an attorney. Um, our, our city attorney took the time out and stated uh, and called the attorney to see if we could go forward, if they would have any objection. They did not have an object, any um, objection to us going forward. Therefore, we did pass the resolution to come out of committee. And with that, I would um, to ask, uh, pass the resolution that we deny the claim for $1,824. This was the pop-up trailer that had all yes. the trash inside. I'm sorry, the pictures are, are up there for everyone to see. Okay, um, are there any questions or concerns? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Uh, aye, opposed, passes unanimously. Thank uh, you. Council Member Washington. The next one we have is claim disposition, claim number 1634. This is for Vonda Gilliam for $668 in trash fees at 909 Furley Street. Um, I'm sure we'll have the pictures in a minute. This is for indoor furniture outside on 8218 with a compliance date of 8-9-2018. The contractor arrived on 8 16 19. Um, she had the couch. She stated she had her couch outside and it got rained on. So when she received the notification, she moved it to the side of the house near the garage. You can see it up there um, for it to dry. Um, she referenced photos and confirmed she did move it and she would have, uh, if she would have known the other items in the backyard were debris, she would have moved them as well. She appealed to the committee uh, stating that her mortgage company had paid the taxes and now her escrow is short because of it and her mortgage will go up. She stated that she didn't know about this until it appeared on her taxes. This uh, picture view is actually taken from the street. You can see all of this um, by the street. This from the street. This did go before the claims review committee. Um, we did uh, vote to pull this out as a denial. So with that, I would move the resolution to deny the claim. Are there any questions or concerns, Councilmember Jackson? Just really quickly, while I'll be voting no is just the, because she mentioned in her hearing that she at one point called the city, be at the city attorney's office for more information on how to kind of go through the appeal process where it is. But in the meantime, it went on her tax roll um, and, and she didn't have the communication. So my um, proposal would be to take off at least the administrative fee because when someone calls the city of Lansing, no matter what department it is, they want certain answers or direction, and I don't think she got that here, so that's why I'll be voting no. All right. Um, with that, we have a motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 
uh, passes uh, with two no. Um, that takes us to public services. Council Member, Vice President Spadafore. Thank you, Madam President. We have a resolution to set a public hearing in consideration of, of special assessment for the Glen Burn Commons trash and grass abatement. This is roll GB2018. Um, this public hearing will be on March 25th, 2019 at 7 p.m. here in City Hall Chambers. The clerk, see Mr. Swope, will be um, sending notice to owners that are affected by this special assessment. Uh, real quick, it's in total a $29,638 assessment. That's uh, $75.79, I'm sorry, $65.72 per occupied parcel. Last year, this assessment was $75.79. Uh, that's good news that it went down because it means we have more occupied parcels, people living there uh, to distribute out among. Mm -hmm. So um, we will, at the public hearing, take appeals on that. But we went through this last year. This was the, um, there's a commons area there where a neighborhood association had previously existed but did not exist any longer to take care of it. So the city created a special assessment. The city council created a special assessment district there. This is that, so I would move the resolution. And um, a resolution set the public hearing, and this is for the 25th, correct? I'm sorry, the 25th at 7 p.m., yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, are there any questions or concerns? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. In my um, moving, trying to move swiftly along, we did forget one in general services. Let's go back to the last claim um, that we have just before the public service. And that's uh, Council Member Washington. Um, thank you, Madam President. What we have before us is a resolution for claim number 1657. This is C. Skinner at 1001 West Hillsdale in the amount of $4,500. Mr. Sanford stated to the committee that the property had been cited seven times and has been cleaned by the contractor prior to this violation. This particular violation was granted an extension and the claimant is aware of the premise violations. The department recommends denial, but we need to make note that the owner has made a payment, so the remaining balance is $3,554. With that, I would move the resolution to deny the claim in the amount of $4,500. We have a motion um, to deny the claim. Do we have any questions or concerns? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay, we're to the Committee on Intergovernmental Relations. Uh, Council Member Jackson. Thank you, Madam President. What we have here today is a resolution to transfer funds from certain places um, to secure the beginning phase of a climate action plan that we discussed a few weeks back. Basically, we're asking to transfer $2,500 from the City Council Temporary Help uh, contractual fund and $2,500 from the City Council Equipment Fund um, and move that to the public service contractual services. And just for a little background, the Climate Action Plan is something that um, the city through the administration and council is excited to work on. Um, basically, we need to hire a position, a contractual position of a person who has the ability to go through all the departments and identify um, the issues, talk to the people, and basically there's a three or four page contract that uh, sets out all of the person's obligations. Um, and long story short, um, in order to make a climate action plan effective, we need to basically know as a city what we're doing and where there's room for improvement and from my understanding, we don't have volunteers capable of putting the time necessary to get all that. Um, so again, the mayor's, well, I guess public service is um, with some of their budget available, more than doubling the 5,000 we're asking for to basically e equal 13,000 for this person whose job and experience is to um, work on this stuff. So I guess, you know, some of the whereas um, basically just says that we're trying to transfer that money. It goes through the contract on some of the things, the Climate Action Plan, phase one, 
would work on and do and some of the goals it will achieve. Uh, the language in those paragraphs comes straight from the um, contract, which you know we could talk about in detail if anybody has questions. Um, but I guess I would move the resolution for a transfer of $2,500 from the City Council Temporary Help Contract and $2,500 from the City Council Equipment to the Public Services uh, Contractual Services account for the reason to hire this person to help us begin phase one of a climate action plan. All right, we have the motion before us. Do we have any questions? Um, my question on this is I had, the, the contract is 13,000, so the way this is worded then, the balance of this will be paid out of the public service department. I had thought the mayor had indicated they were going to take some from his funds. Mayor Shore? Well, when the resolution was introduced, I thought, and I thought the question at the time was 5,000 is coming from public service, 5,000 is coming from council, where's the balance? Um, it right. turned out I had not had a chance to see the resolution. The resolution is moving 5,000 from council into public service, and public service has identified the balance. So they will Correct. supply the balance. All right, just so that we understand that. All right, with that, um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. And we're to the Committee on Ways and Means. Uh, Council Member Spitzley. Thank you, Madam President. What we have before us is a, a grant acceptance um, for the Human Relations and Community Services Department. Um, it's a $453,579 um, grant total um, for um, continuing care for Lansing under the Emergency Solutions Grant Notice. Um, the, the Human Relations and Community Services, they're the fiduci fiduciary of this, this dollar amount, this grant, um, but it is um, um, for, for Ingham County, and they receive funds to provide emergency shelter. It also provides support for the Housing Assessment and Resource Agency, um, which is a centralized intake system for those experiencing housing issues in Ingham County. And with that, I move the resolution to accept the grant. We have a motion on the floor. Do we have any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Um, thank you, Madam President. The next uh, item is a grant acceptance of the Ingham County Parks and Trail Millage funding. Um, this is an amount of $2,034.26. Um, the, uh, the, the grant is um, for several things. Um, it's for the trail connect from Cambridge to Francis Park, $400,000 will go towards that. And that $400,000 is for matching funds for the Natural Resources Trust Fund grant that we've also um, uh, received. Um, there was a little bit of um, misinformation in the news this evening where they reported that this uh, project had been uh, suspended. The project hasn't been suspended. What the issue was is um, we are required to do an endangered species study for the endangered snuff box and slipper shell mussels. And so we have to do a, re a study and a report um, on these and then based on that submit it back to the department. It takes a while, um, but the project has not been um, halted. It's just part of the normal process. The other part of this is um, $15,000 for volunteer trail ambassador slash coordinator, um, and then um, uh, $1.6 million approximately is to repair um, several bridges. One of them is the um, Old Town uh, Bridge um, uh, on Cesar Chavez next to the Sir Pizza. The other one is the Kruger Landing on Aurelius Road. Um, there's a bridge um, that goes over Pennsylvania by Parters Park, and there's a, there's a couple more bridges um, that are the north of that. And so those, um, the dollars will be for not for total demolishing of the bridges, but just for repair. This is round four of our grants for Ingham County. We've had a total of $8 million um, in grant money for, for trails um, through the city of Lansing. 
Um, and with that, I will move the resolution. I have a motion on the resolution. Are there any questions or concerns? Council Member Spadafore. No questions or concerns. I think that uh, the uh, Council Member Spitzley did a great job of explaining it. One thing that was out there in the news, these are not car bridges that are being repaired. I no, think that's yes. clear to us, but the news kind of reported that these were going to be bridges, yes. the roads that the cars travel on, and they're all trails bridges. So yep. I've got a lot of questions, like how can you fix so many bridges for such a little amount of right, money, but right. can't fix the roads? This is not a roads thing. This is a trails thing. Thank you, Council Member. I should have said that. Thanks for that. Council Member Hussein. I believe you had our Parks Director into the Ways and Means Committee, correct? Did he talk about how they prioritize projects that they'd like to see funded by this, by this millage, this county millage? N not, he didn't specifically talk on this grant application, but he did just talk about that the bridges are in disrepair. And so it's all a part of, you know, continuing to make, you know, this area a walkable community and those, bridge, those bridges do need to be addressed. But um, he, didn't really, he didn't really go into a, a prioritization of how, why those five bridges. And I, and I was just curious because when we talk about connectivity, when we talk about trail amenities, I mean, this certainly isn't the first year that we went out for, um, you know, project applications and things like that. So I'm just curious as to how we are prioritizing those projects. Um, and I think I saw uh, Mayor Shore's hand up. Um, but I, I would also like to, on the record, thank the, uh, this iteration of the Ingham County Board of Commissioners. Uh, this was uh, originally levied back in, um, I believe, 2000. Mm -hmm. It's a six-year six um, millage, and it was passed back in 2014. Uh, and my understanding is that over the past several years, many of the projects um, were not funded uh, that were applied for, um, and that this particular iteration of uh, the Board of Commissioners said, look, let's get, let's get serious about funding some of these, these projects. Let's dole out this money, and let's get serious about kind of enhancing our, our regional uh, trail system. So I really appreciate that. Mayor Shore. Uh, it is my understanding that a lot of the, the, the priorities is based on the condition and the need, mm -hmm. um, and then the points. There are points that are, that are scored um, we put in, originally we put in several proposals to the, the county, um, as uh, Councilman Hussein mentioned, only if, uh, well, many of them were funded, but not all of them. But I know one of them that was not funded was actually funded by the state. It was one of the top five projects of the state and the county didn't fund it. So I very politely raised some concerns with our commissioner friends, but um, several of the commissioners that I talked to, the Lansing commissioners, had concerns that there was a lot of money in this fund that was being collected with tax dollars through a millage that wasn't getting issued because of, of um, cut lines that really were not explainable. Um, so, you know, commissioners Tennyson, Morgan, Seabolt, and um, uh, Slaughter, and many of our commissioners kind of got on got on that and made some changes, and um, and all of the projects were funded. Um, which means ours and throughout the county. So now the dollars are, are being spent. I think Commissioner Grebner has been on this for several years since it passed. So uh, I also am appreciative of the county commission for jumping in and, and making sure that the dollars that, they're being, that are being collected by the taxpayers are going towards fixes. And of course, Lansing gets our, our fair share of those dollars as we should be, because we provide a fair share of those dollars. Okay. And it should be noted, just one more thing, Madam President, that the, um, the match for the grant, um, the city match, Lance, city of Lansing matches for, through our parks millage. Okay. If um, that, that is true, and it's partially true, because some of these grants are, are state grants that we're using right. the county funds to match, so that doesn't come from our millage. Um, some of the, one or a few of these projects I know we're using county funds to match state uh, natural Resources Trust Fund, um, but so it's 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 true. But where we don't have to, we don't use our parks millage because we'd rather use the county millage dollars to match state and get those projects funded. All right. My thank apologies you. for jumping in. Not a problem. Um, thank you. Um, with that, we have a motion. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed. Passes unanimously. Vice President Spadafor. Thank you, Madam President. I've got. Um, it's a resolution. Yep, a resolution regarding the refunding of our tax increment finance authority bonds or the TIFA. Recall we had a presentation at the Committee of the Whole on the 4th where Ms. Bennett shared with us this is a refinancing opportunity from our 2009 TIFA bonds. Um, we're expecting to save about $2 million between now and 2039 based on that refinancing. Um, if the interest rates don't prove to be beneficial, they will not go forward with the refinancing. So I'll move the resolution. 
I have a motion on the resolution. We had this presentation before us at our last committee of a whole. Are there any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Vice President Spadafore. Uh, similar situation here, but with the Build America bonds. These were a 2009 bond from the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, or ARA, uh, the stimulus package. Um, if we refinance these at this point in time, the estimated savings is going to be $1.9 million between now and 2031. Same caveats. I move the resolution. All right. I have a motion on the resolution. Are there any questions or concerns? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Vice President Spadafore. Madam President, a resolution that is in front of us now is the fiscal year 2018 budget carry forwards. Um, let me double check my notes on this one. These are just um, carry forwards mostly in the Human Services Agency, um, as well as a very, very small portion of the council operating budget. Um, but those are for HRCS expenditures. If Correct me if I'm wrong. I think I'm remembering that correctly. The 1.25. The 1.25%, and that's um, required to stay in this budget area. So we're moving about $291,000 um, into line items for 2018-19, from the fiscal year 18 into 2018-19. And I'm going go ahead. go ahead. Were you finished? I move the resolution. I have a motion on the resolution. I'm going to pass the um, gavel. Um, I'm going to ask to be recused. This is um, from the 1.25 um, that um, services agencies and the agency that I work for receives uh, money out of the 1.25, even though the ones that are listed here are not my agencies. Um, but I, I do receive money out of this, so I'm going to um, ask to be recused. All right, so we'll need a motion to excuse, um, to, recuse. to recuse, excuse me. It's been moved by Council Member Spitzley to recuse Council President Wood from the vote on the resolution for fiscal year 2018 budget carry forwards. Is there any discussion? We'll need a roll call on this. Is that correct? No? All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Now um, for the motion on the Fiscal Year 2018 Budget Care Forward Resolution. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Okay, we are to ordinances for introduction. The Committee on Development and Planning introduced an ordinance of the City of Lansing, Michigan to amend Chapter 888 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Lansing for the purposes of renaming the project sponsor and providing for an extension of a service charge in lieu of taxes for existing low income family units for a project known as 517 North Walnut Apartments pursuant to the provisions of the State Housing Development Authority Act of 1966 as amended. The ordinance is read a first time by its title. And that would be Council Member um, Hussein. Sure, so what we have before us are um, two ordinances um, that uh, Essentially what we're looking to do is, is to change uh, the sponsor name and also to extend uh, existing 30-year pilots. Um, and we actually, and, and let me first say, I'm sorry that, that it's taken this long to get to our CAP representatives. We actually have uh, Raleigh Van Fossen, um, and, and congratulations on the new executive director position. Uh, we have outgoing, um, or I should say former executive director, director Mickey Drosty with us as well as board chair Tom Lapka. Um, I'm going to ask for permission to ask them to come up uh, to readdress the uh, the ordinances and the ask, and then also to uh, to uh, answer questions from uh, committee members or council members, I should say. If you could uh, come up in the well and um, then make sure that your the green light is on when. And again, if you just very briefly um, want to discuss uh, the, the ordinances that we have before us, um, the, the reason essentially for the request, uh, what you're trying to do, we, we discussed a lot in development and planning, um, and there were some questions about uh, the fact that these are existing 30-year pilots, uh, and I think the concern, you know, at, 
at some point we had committee members thinking that what we were looking to do was just to extend two to four years and that would actually be from this point, uh, essentially that they would conclude in two to four years, which that is not the case. And so what we're looking to actually do is to extend these would both, my understanding is conclude in 2036. Uh, but, but again, if you could just very briefly discuss um, the need for this. Thank you. Sounds like you did a great job of it. <laughs> Um, so Capital Area Housing Partnership acquired these two properties when Greater Lansing Housing Coalition went out of business. The, as you said, both of them have pilots that are um, expiring in 32 and 34. Um, and we, as a function of acquiring them, have decided to apply for additional tax credits, which will put about a, another $2.6 million into um, rehabilitation in the in the project, as well as securing um, project-based vouchers, which will allow for the um, support service clients to have rents paid and be able to remain in the building. Um, it additionally sets up a support service um, reserve, which will then guarantee that we can provide the services to the clients that they need to stay stable and housed over that period of time. So because we are applying for an additional um, award of low-income housing tax credits, we have to have um, at least a 15-year window from the time that the project would be placed in service, which we're guessing would be in 2020. And we, just very quickly, um, we have been asked to have the public hearing on March 25th and then also consider uh, action that night. Can you, can you speak to that? Yes, we are kind of on the fast track on this one. Again, we did not acquire the buildings until um, December. We didn't, we, we weren't able to ascertain the fact that we needed the project-based vouchers. And the biggest reason that we're going back to the state for tax credits, in addition to the fact that we can then increase energy efficiency and increase the, the exterior and interior appearance of the building, um, is that the only way that the state will award um, project-based vouchers for the residents that will be in need of them is through this process. So at one point we had originally thought we were gonna apply in the October round and realize we have residents as of June 30 that cannot pay rent without uh, the ability um, of us getting the vouchers awarded to the, to the project. So we are moving it pretty quickly. Yes, and the, the tax credits that we're applying for is an April 1 deadline. Okay, I've got, I have Council Member Washington. Um, thank you, Madam President, and congratulations, Raleigh. I was really happy when I read this. Um, I am typically a no-go on 4% pilots, but this makes sense. Um, we, we had a long discussion and um, these are small these are small housing projects. One's 23 apartments and one is nine. And these places are housing our most difficult um, residents to house. And what's really important to me is you also have supportive services and that's incredibly important. Um, these um, pilots are already in place. They were already approved. It's only an extension of two and four years and so I, I will be, after the public hearing, going back on my absolute no stance on 4% because these make sense. And, and I really appreciate you guys taking over these properties. Um, I live relatively close to one of them. And good luck. And, and I, th I think you'll do a really good job with these residents. Thanks. Thank you very much. Do we have any other questions or comments? Seeing none. So although we you know, spoke to these collectively, we will move them respectively. So um, first, I would move the resolution to set the public hearing uh, for March 25th for the payment in lieu of taxes for 517 North Walnut, Walnut Apartments. All right, we have a motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. And the Committee on Development and Planning introduced an ordinance of the City of Lansing, Michigan to amend Chapter 888 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Lansing for the purposes of renaming the project Sponsor and providing for an extension of a service charge in lieu of taxes for existing low income family units for a project known as 516 West Saginaw Apartments, Ferris Manor, pursuant to the provisions of the State Housing Development Authority Act of 1966, as amended. The ordinance is read a first time by its title and referred to the Committee on Development and Planning. Mr. Hussein. Well, with that being said, I would move the resolution uh, to set the public hearing uh, for the payment in lieu of taxes for Ferris Manor, 516 West Saginaw Apartments for March 25th. 
And we have a uh, motion on that. Any other questions or concerns? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, we are to ordinances for passage. We have an ordinance of the City of Lansing, Michigan to amend Chapter 872 of the Lansing Codified Ordinances by amending Sections 872.01 through 872.07 to create licensing and re regulation for dockless electric scooter companies to park on and utilize the public rights of way to set licensing fees for such companies that which wish to use the public rights of way to provide for regulation of how such electric scooters may be parked and operated consistent with public health, safety, and welfare, including speed, manner, and location. The ordinance is read a second time by its title, it was reported from the Committee on Public Services, and is on the order of immediate passage. Vice President Spadafore. Yes, um, and I ask my colleagues forgiveness. We do have a substitute on this. There were a few changes that needed to be made um, after so this. So you'd like to move, the, move substitute. the substitute? All right, we have a motion to move the substitute, and then he can address those changes. So we have a motion. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. <laughs> so you would now like to talk about the substitute. Sure. So the, the substitute uh, la labeled floor draft one dated 3819 in front of you um, deals with a lot of the regulation stays the same in how we this came through at the public hearing but we had a lot of feedback at the public hearing a lot of questions from the council members that we incorporated into the committee draft three and floor draft one so I'm going to go through the changes um, just to remind folks I'll, I'll answer any questions you have after that but we'll go through the changes first. So the first change is going to be, stand by. Oh, they took the highlights out. All right, one moment, please. The f they took the highlights out on me, so I gotta double check I don't skip something. Oh, the first change is going to be on page four of the draft that is under section 872.02. Um, the definition sub two says provide easily visible contact information on each electric scooter. Originally the language said that it's two inches, the font is two inches in size. Um, we heard back from the folks that sort of run these things that that wasn't practical on their devices. So we, we talked to public service, we talked with the city attorney's office, and came up with a unique identification number and font that is visible from 30 feet away while the electric scooter is parked upright. So that'll give you basically center line of the street to the sidewalk in most situations, um, is what I've been told the visibility will work from in that, in that, in that respect. Questions on that? Next item we added was sub eight on the same page, but it continues on to the next one. Impl uh, implement a marketing and targeted community outreach plan at the person's own cost. Nope, not that one, sorry. Sub nine, coordinate with the city to implement an educational campaign at the person's own cost to inform the public regarding permissible parking locations, speed limits, safety equipment requirements and recommendations and general courtesy. So this was out of response from the public hearing input that folks were not using these correctly. Um, this is an attempt to have the scooter companies that license with the city provide us with resources, dollar or otherwise Facebook videos, those kinds of things that we can use um, to e educate the community on how to do this without spending taxpayer dollars on, the, on educating someone on using private, um, private goods. The next item is sub 13, um, comply with any limit on the number of electric scooters that may be within the city at the start of each day, but only if such limit has been recommended to city council by the public service director after a study based on usage data shared pursuant to section 87204, that's the section that requires them to share some data, de-identified data with us, to determine general use patterns and over congestion of electric scooters within the city, and only if such recommended limit has been affirmed and adopted by resolution of the city council. This gives the council an opportunity to weigh in on those caps through the committee process and through the process around this table. We weren't sure what the number was, and you know, I kept 
asserting that if they're not being used, they'll take them off the road, which is generally how that works. But we also wanted some security in here that allows us to sort of take a look at the data and say there's there's too many scooters in the city that aren't being used. This is clearly you're just, they're just parked in our rights of way for no reason, and it allows us to pass that resolution. Second is in um, B on the same page. We lowered the fee, the annual fee, from five thousand dollars to two thousand five hundred dollars, and we did that using um, industry standards, comparable enforcement um, costs associated with other regulatory ordinances, such as bike parking and things like that. Um, and then what we in anticipate the cost of implementing the ordinance will be. So it, it's justifiable through the city attorney has vetted that to make sure it's an appropriate licensing fee. It's also worth noting it's the same licensing fee. Our sister to the uh, east has put in there at $2,500. So not only are we connecting the corridor with hotels and mixed-use senior housing, but we have similar regulations. And then the second piece of that section is we change the fee structure from a dollar per scooter per day to be 10 cents per ride that originates in the city of Lansing. And that's something um, that we can actually... Can, can I get you to stop for just a second? We've gone off the air um, for City TV, if you would... Um, check to see where we're at, please. So they're working on that. Okay. We're just, a, all right, we're back on again. Thank you. All right, I'll just back up just a slight bit. Uh, rather than $1 per scooter per day in the city of Lansing, where we've put a 10 cent per ride that originates in the city of Lansing fee, um, this is, you, you receive feedback at the public hearing that that's really, the dollar per day was not the model that's being used nationwide. And further, upon a little bit more analysis, the data that we can collect through their dashboards that they hand over to the city is easier to see the rides that originate here. And it's, you're going to have to decide where you're going to count the scooters, how they count, if they're being charged, do they count. This is a much cleaner way for us to ensure that we're receiving the appropriate dollars that we're supposed to be receiving for our complete streets initiatives. Um, and that, one more change on page nine. Um, in response to some concerns from council members about weather um, and special events, um, we put in an or uh, section E on the top of page nine, parking of electric scooters in public rights of way may be temporarily suspended on the determination of the Director of Public Services for safety concerns, including but not limited to inclement weather, otherwise permitted special events or public gatherings, otherwise permitted construction, and otherwise permitted use of the public rights of way. We talked a lot in the committee and around this tape, this dais, about um, sort of a date specific or a time specific, and when we, ke we kept coming back to weather doesn't follow the law. So, I mean, we live in Michigan, so that was really kind of, um, what we're looking at. And in the current operating agreement, the city um, actually put in there a requirement that each company develop a cold weather operating plan that pulls the, pulls them off after a certain period of time or, or after snowfall, et cetera. So we're hoping, at least this was the committee's discussion, we're hoping that this would satisfy the weather requirements without having to go too specific in the ordinance. Um, and we can always revisit it. But that was where we ended up on that section. So. The substitute has been moved, correct? So I'm going to move the ordinance for in, for adoption. Are there any questions or um, concerns? Councilmember Washington. Thank you, Madam President. Councilman Spadafore, I, I'm going to support this, but I still have some really big concerns. I can't tell you how many of these scooters I have taken out of the middle of the sidewalk. They're heavy. And they're just sitting there. People are being really irresponsible when they're riding them, coming to, you know, racing down the sidewalks downtown. I've been nearly hit about three times. I don't see how we're going to enforce this. And I guess I also want to know who, who's going to be responsible for gathering this information on how many rides and how many scooters are needed and and all of the rest of this. I, I don't know. I, ju I just have concerns. There's just really no way to, to enforce the safety aspects. And we have a lot of disabled folks in this community. It, it really concerns me. Uh, Vice President Spadafore. 
I um, appreciate your concerns, Councilmember Washington, um, and I know you were uh, right there along through the committee process, at least parts of last year, and appreciate your input. The safety issue is definitely a concern, and that's why we're pushing the education component as well, and it will take some time to get folks to understand. We learned a lot, I think, in our pilot last year, and the question about who collects the data, that data is collected by the, the, the licensees, and they're required to turn that over to us, and um, the, at least one, to, to the public service department, to the city of Lansing. And um, at least one of them, and I can't speak to all of them, but I, was, I saw a demonstration, gave login credentials to the city to, to look at at any time to verify the accuracy of the data they turned over. So I'm confident that there won't be any gamesmanship in the data part of it, but the this, this safety part will require some education and some um, frank conversations with people on the sidewalks. I, I feel your pain on downtown. I get hit by the sandwich delivery guy on his bike quite a bit, and I, I never hesitate to tell him what he's doing wrong out loud. So. Okay. Are there any other questions? Uh, my question um, or, or concern, uh, Council, Vice President Spadafor, is um, we did not see the companies abiding by the temporary agreement when it came to weather. When we ended up with the snow, we had several instances of them still being in the right of way and on sidewalks and people having to walk over them in the snow. So I'm wondering whether if we added an F under that, that um, we um, set um, by resolution either yearly um, or we picked a date um, uh, that we would set it um, by that would still give if we ended up with snow earlier would give them the Public Service Department an opportunity to take them off um, but at least we would have something um, certain um, with that. My hesitation uh, as, this is just Peter speaking personally uh -huh. as I said what you know the weather doesn't always follow the law and the, and the times can be very unpredictable and we're looking at, originally it looked like the city of East Lansing was going to go with some date specific time, so it made sense to create some parity there. But they've also gone to sort of the inclement weather model with the city, man they have a city manager, obviously different than our structure, but the chief administrator of the city has the ability to make that declaration. Um, and I feel it, it's more appropriate to have that flexibility um, than a state specific um, without seeing specific language. That's my personal opinion. Mr. City Attorney. I would just point out also that in the inclement weather section that you added, following that is license revocation. So if there are uh, events where the licensee is not following the directive, there are other procedures for a hearing under 872.06, okay. putting the license in jeopardy. So okay. there is some teeth to that. All right. Are there other questions. Councilmember Hussein. That was actually going to be my comment as well. It, in acknowledging that we had issues uh, with the temporary licensing agreement last year, um, there is some fear too. Uh, you know, whether it be uh, Bird or Lime or there's a new company spin, uh, anybody that applies for this, you know, there's, there's certainly is some concern that there won't be compliance with this with this ordinance, but the, because there is revocation language and because we do have the authority uh, to go back into this, should this be an ongoing issue and if for whatever reason the revocation language is, um, I shouldn't say the revocation language, but the revocation process uh, isn't working, uh, we can certainly open this back up and amend. Um, I want to, uh, you know, give Councilman Spadafore and the Public Service Committee last year uh, a lot of credit as well as the Public Service Committee um, this year uh, for bringing all of these issues pertaining to, to scooters uh, across the goal line. Um, we have to do something, and I, th I think that's what uh, Councilman Spadafore and the Public Service Committee has, has been trying to do. Uh, we've seen issues with these scooters all across the country. I think everybody's kind of waiting for somebody else to take the lead. Um, you know, my understanding is that there are a number of municipalities in the, in the state of Michigan that are waiting for us um, to, to finalize this and actually use this as a model, so I certainly appreciate that. The safety uh, aspect does still concern me. I know that Detroit has had a number of issues with uh, pedestrian and, and scooter uh, collisions. Uh, I have a student who missed three days of school, even though you're not supposed to be on these unless you're 18 years of age, missed three days of school last year um, due to a pretty significant um, uh, accident. She was actually riding the scooter uh, illegally. Um, so I'm concerned about that, but again, with the revocation language and the ability to uh, open up this ordinance at some point, I'm comfortable moving forward. 
Okay, my final question on this, Councilmember Member Spadafore, is under the section that it talks about limits, um, it will be set by resolution. When do you intend to bring a resolution on that? I think we need a little bit more time to see what the usage looks like. We only had about eight to 10 weeks of usage where there wasn't inclement weather to see what the numbers look like. And that was at a 250 scooter cap per company. Um, so there wasn't enough information there. That's why we left it up to kind of using the data that we've asked for to determine if we're over scootered, if that's a term I can coin for today um, in the city. But I guess the question would be is if once this passed, you ended up with a thousand um, scooters here, you can't go back then and pass a resolution and say that you can only. It's my understanding that we can as a condition of the license. Mr. They have to agree to these stipulations. City Attorney. Well, there has to be a the procedure in the ordinances for an application for a license to be made. And it, it's at that point when the language can be inserted to take care of the issue you're talking about. That was yeah, not, Vice President Spadafore. Yeah, that was not what we were understanding. And this was supposed to be an allowance to go back and say the city can at one time after looking at data place a cap yeah. on the number of scooters in the city, which would then be imposed on the Correct. licensees. Correct. Maybe I misunderstood Chair's question. I thought she was suggesting that after the ordinance is passed, they immediately could go and blanket the city with a No, scooter. yeah. No, that's not the case. But we, I'll, Council Member Wood, Council President Wood, I think is asking if we pass this ordinance and we license to, let's say, two companies, and we determine that there's a thousand scooters in the city and that's too many, we can go back after looking at the data, pass the resolution, say we should only allow 500. Can we y do that? Yes. Okay. So we're able to do that. Yeah. All right, thank you. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Adoption of the ordinance, Council Member Dunbar. Yes. Council Member Garza. Yes. Council Member Hussein. Yes. Council Member Jackson. Councilmember Spadafore. Yes. Councilmember Council Spitzley. Yes. Councilmember Washington. Yes. Councilmember Wood. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Eight yeas, zero nays, the ordinance is adopted. Madam President, I'd move for immediate effect. You don't want time to look at the data before we. <laughs> we don't get the data until we sign the license. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we have a motion for immediate effect. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same side. All right. <laughs> okay. We are to speaker registration for public comment on city government related matters. That's the yellow sheet in the back. Uh, sign in uh, right now. Give you about 10 seconds. Um, and in the meantime, we're to reports of city officers, boards, and commissions. Vice Vice. President Spadafore. Madam President, I would move that all items be considered as being read in full and that the proper referrals be made by you. I have a motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. We have minutes of uh, letters from the city clerk regarding minutes of boards, commissions, and authorities. Placed on file. Uh, fireworks display by the Lansing Log Nuts and Melrose Pyrotechnics for various dates. General Services. Letters from the Mayor regarding Z1 2019, 901 Cleveland Street. Uh, development and Planning. Z2 2019, 714 North Pine Street. Development and Planning. Act 2 2019, the East Side Connector. Development and Planning. Act 3 2019, the Bear Lake Pathway. We have a series of these that at first were going to go to public service, but looking at the headings of each one of these, they have come through from uh, the development office, so are going to development and planning. Okay, Act 6, 2019, Wise Road Parcel. Development and planning. Uh, Act 7, 2019, Willard Road Parcel. Development and planning. Uh, Act 8, 2019, Hunters Ridge. Development and planning. 
uh, Red Sear Development's seventh amendment to the amended and restated real estate purchase and development agreement. Committee of the whole. Communications and petitions, claim appeal, uh, claim number 1656 for trash violations. General services. Affidavit of disclosure, Brent Sorg, Lansing Police Department. Ethics board. Communication from Max Donovan uh, regarding ranked choice voting. Committee of the whole. Claim appeal, Harold Lehman for legal expenses. That will go back to the city attorney's office. Uh, affidavit of disclosure, Dominic Cochran of the Lansing Public Media Center. Ethics board. And we're to remarks by council members. Are there any closing remarks by council members? Council member Spadafore. At the risk of getting stuff thrown at me for keeping us here longer, I just do want to thank everybody for their support on that and their help in getting that drafted and the, the great input that we had on that. We will learn a lot as we work through this process still and um, I remain committed to tweaking the ordinance should we need to do so. So I appreciate everyone's concerns, the public input, um, and the time that has spent on this, particularly Greg in the city attorney's office for answering many of my phone calls and emails and text messages um, as we tried to make this work. So thank you. You're welcome. Any other comments by council members? Bye. Seeing none. <coughs> Are there any comments from the mayor's office? I just want to point out that I think this is my longest meeting yet, and it had to be the day I'm wearing this tie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, we are to public comment on city government related matters. We have Marie Hansen followed by Robert Oye. Is Marie still here? Yes. Oh, there she is. I am Marie Hansen and I live at 901 Smith Avenue. And I'm here to talk about the wet weather control program, which for years we called the sewer separation project. Isn't this our year, we would say, for the last seven years? Last summer was our year. And it's a, it's a two year project in our neighborhood, but we're pretty much done where I live. And I have to say that this is the most irritating, uh, annoying experience that has had the most wonderful results. And I'm telling you this because if you haven't experienced it, you, you don't know it. I don't know how many people here have, but um, our neighborhood is so much more beautiful. We have roads that are good roads. We have new curbs. Um, this is the best thing to be happening to Lansing. It's a slow moving project because it goes with little amounts, but it is, it is a fabulous thing in terms of our infrastructure, improving our overall, I mean, it's like a school millage. That does a great thing too. Uh, our parks are doing great things. So there are some things, and the, the wet weather control program is one of them. And I'm telling you this because I know that some people from my neighborhood came in here and complained about something. There's lots to complain about, but it just requires patience and you get through it, and it's fabulous. So if you doubt me, drive by 901 Smith and see the little thing they did in our driveway. They put new entrances. It was all crumbled. We thought we ought to get it fixed, but we said, let's wait for the sewer separation project, <laughs> you see. So anyway, I'm telling you this, the mayor probably gets some credit because I think it's his public service department. They did a great job on communication. They're having this meeting. They leave things on your door. I even saw the men working there at one point move a car, we couldn't figure out who it belonged to. It wasn't anybody in the neighborhood that had parked where they were gonna be paving. And these guys figured out how to move it to another road. <laughs> that, I, I was terribly impressed with them throughout the whole thing. And I know some people complained, but I'm here to tell you, when you get some of those complaints, listen with another year be, ear because it's really a, a really good thing. We appreciate your comments. Thank you for coming down. Thank you. Next we have uh, Robert Ovae. Is Robert still here? No. no. Okay. Uh, Hugh McNichol and then Loretta Stanaway. Uh, 
Madam President and members of council, my name is Hugh McNichol. I'm a small business owner and lifelong resident of Lansing. I'm here tonight with my two well-behaved kids to voice my support for the ranked choice voting proposal in your correspondence agenda. I've been an advocate of ranked choice voting for a long time. For those that still don't know what RCV is, ranked choice voting allows voters to rank their candidates on their ballot, first choice, second choice, third, and so on, as many or as few as you'd like. Millions of voters across the country are already allowed to rank their candidates in local elections. Cambridge, Massachusetts has allowed voters to rank their choices in every election since the 1940s. Santa Fe implemented RCV last year and experienced record voter turnout, 38%, with no initiatives on the ballot, only candidates. Even though it was their first time using the new system, more than 99.9% .9 of ballots cast were valid. 88% of voters chose to rank their ballots, and more than 60% of voters ranked all five candidates for mayor. They used the same Dominion tabulators that we use, and their results were reported on election night. Millions of voters in San Francisco, Oakland, and the Bay Area have been ranking their choices since the early 2000s. Our voter turnout here in Lansing is usually around 10% in the primary and 15% in the general, if we're lucky, which was about the same as Minneapolis before they passed RCV. But after passing RCV in 2006, their voter turnout steadily increased all the way up to 42.45% in 2017. Like Santa Fe, that was with no proposals on the ballot. Ranked choice voting encourages friendlier campaigns, too. Candidates in RCV elections tell stories about going door to door, even up to houses with a competitor sign on it, to find common ground. As valuable and expensive as this sounds, our city clerk, Chris Wolpe, actually estimates that RCV could save us $80,000 every election cycle. Remember that when we're talking about the budget. That $80,000 could be another police officer or firefighter, or maintenance worker, or code enforcement officer's job. We could train paramedics. We could create another beacon field or something like it for a different activity and fully fund it. Let voters decide if they'd like to rank their candidates or if they'd rather keep our pick one plurality system. Anyone who examines them side by side should see that ranked choice voting is better. We're looking forward to this proposal being discussed in committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Loretta. Stanaway and then Linda Appling. A few more points on the uh, red cedar thing. Um, they still didn't say where the floodwaters would go if there was a flood. They said something about Williamston, and so I guess I'm left to imagine there's this flood, everything fills up, Williamston somehow turns on something somewhere, there's this giant sucking sound, and the floodwaters are gone. I think I need a better explanation of that. And it's okay to have uh, the parkland still be contaminated soil. I'm not sure I'm so fond of that idea. I've heard nothing about remediating the soil in the parts of this development that would become parkland. And we've heard nothing at all about what the developers feel is necessary in terms of a profit margin for them to make this doable. Do they need to make $100 million over 30 years? $50 million? $300 million? $500 million? We've not heard a word about what they expect to profit. What if someone else could come in and do a different project or a different deal and only needed to make $50 million? and scaled back the brownfield to a comparable level, and we only had to give a third or a half over 30 years in brownfield that we're offering these folks. East Lansing took 10 plus years to get their development project on the corner of Abbott and Grand River, correct. We don't have to jump just because the hoop is there. We don't have to keep annihilating historic mom and pop businesses in efforts to gentrify everything from MSU to the Capitol building. And we also, um, where did it go? Well, I think that might be it, except to say one last thing. We're not Madison. We're never going to be Madison. We're not Columbus. We're never going to be Columbus. Let's quit saying we need to be or try to be, and let's just be Lansing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Linda Appling, and then... Fred McLaughlin? Yeah. Uh, 
Hello, uh, for the record, my name is Linda Appling and I live at 4010 Thacken Drive in Lansing, Michigan. Today I'm representing Leno. As an aside, before I begin, I'd like to request that uh, the location for the hearing under 13B3, uh, that that be held in Eaton County, perhaps at uh, Wood Creek Achievement Center as all the residents live in that area. And they might like to have some input in it. But today, I'm here regarding the potential merger of the Lansing Courts with Ingham County. I'm opposed to this merger. I live in Eaton County, and such a merger would eliminate my ability to vote for judges who would hear cases involving Leno residents. Despite being unable to vote for such judges, we would still be taxed and subject to their jurisdiction. Frankly, I and others in Eaton County, and it, it's more than just me, are tired of being taxed and not being able to vote on the representative. This is not the first time such a situation has occurred. The zoo, which was supported by our tax dollars and is now under Ingham County, forces Leno residents to pay parking at a higher rate than Ingham County. When the zoo was, when the zoo was originally assumed by e Ingham, Lansing failed to consider the residents of Eaton County in the fight to have, the, have us receive the lower parking. Another example is the 9-11 tax. I pay a 9-11 tax to the city of Lansing, as does anyone in the city of Lansing who has a landline. Yet I can't vote on candidates for the Ingham County Board, which controls 9-11. Believe me, this is irritating. Once again, Leno residents are forced to pay taxes to an institution where they cannot participate in the election of the representatives. We do not want the same type of process of exclusion to occur with the judges. Essentially, we're tired of being treated as unwanted stepchildren in terms of our ability to vote, and especially when it involves our taxes. It is... And essentially, we also, it's also our understanding that only the mayor is participating in the merger discussions. Leno believes that additional elected officials should be at the table. We do want some type of representative, and we want to be able to vote for our judges. We do not want to be excluded from that process and yet still forced to pay for them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is uh, Fred McLaughlin. Hello, council members. Um, thank you very, very much for this time. Uh, I just wanted to come down and after a lot of years, um, I moved here in 1975 and ever since I moved here, I've ridden my bicycle all over town. Uh, not full time, the last 15 years has been full time. Uh, wouldn't work for everybody, it works for me. Uh, so I've been riding for, I don't know, 40 some years. <laughs> And uh, I want to thank you very much for the bike system in this town. It really makes a big difference to me. Um, because I'm a full-time commuter at this point in time, it's especially important to me. And I really appreciate the earlier remarks on, uh, on Smith Street and similar streets that have been improved because one of the things that a, a cyclist relies on, especially a full-time commuter like myself, is you have to have a parallel route to the major streets. And it's especially important that those routes be cleared uh, and, of course, identified so that they can be cleared. And so I wanted to thank you for the effort that goes into the consideration for the bike path. I really appreciated going along the, uh, the river walk uh, today. Um, uh, let's see, going, crossing 496 and uh, uh, going down into uh, uh, the, um, the river walk that goes along the, uh, the plant there and then comes up on uh, Moore's Park. That had been closed off for a while for, uh, for an eroded embankment, and that's been repaired. And I really appreciate that. It allowed me to get off the major streets. And so thanks, thanks very much. I, that's all I had to say. I, I don't have any complaints. <laughs> Thank you, Fred. Thank You're you. welcome. That's it. 
Is there that it? We're done with it. All right, then we are adjourned. Did you remember me?